Okay, I think we are broadcasting now and I can see people coming in. Very exciting. I'm really excited. Are you excited, Rachel? I'm so excited. How are you seeing people come? Oh yeah, now I see where people are coming jumping in. Jumping and jumping. And I have to say like the fact that several hundred people want to spend their Saturday with us talking, talking about, about kitten poop. I feel more seen than I've ever felt in my entire life. Um, happy. So did you know that there are more people than just me and you who want to talk about this? The only reason I know is my text, my text inbox is yes. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Of photos of like, what is this? What is that? Yeah. So that's my only I'm just gonna give just a moment to make sure everybody can get in who's gonna be coming in. Um while we're waiting, I'm gonna show off my my shirt that I'm wearing today. My I didn't. I wore heart talking about kitten poop. I wore one to brunch the other day, and nobody commented. They were probably really? like, "Yeah." Did anybody give you weird looks? I don't think so. <laughs> I don't think so. I just got like nothing, and I was like, "This is so disappointing." Oh this man. Well, maybe they like talking about kitten poop too. I don't know. Anyway, um, I think that we can go ahead and begin. So thank you to everybody who is, oh, it's still going up. There's a yeah. lot of people here. Well, we'll, we'll begin. Uh, so first of all, thank you to everybody who has joined us this morning for the ultimate scoop on kitten poop. I wanna thank Cat Camp for having us talk about this when they let us know that they wanted us to talk about kitten poop. I think I like jumped for joy, I was so excited. Um, obviously I wanna thank Rachel, Dr. Rachel Wallach for being here with me. Um, and also we wanna thank Pet Ag, Pet Products um, for sponsoring this talk and making it possible for us to all be here together uh, talking about this really important subject. So uh, there is a giveaway happening. If you are registered for this event, which you all are, uh, then you already are entered. Um, and uh, this is a giveaway for five kitten starter kits. And they are going to be emailing uh, later on this upcoming week, the winners. And as long as you have a US uh, mailing address that you can send it to, you are eligible to win. Uh, I wanna make sure that I do some quick housekeeping actually, uh, just let everybody know that the chat is open and the Q&A is open. We will be doing Q&A at the end. Uh, so you're welcome to put some questions in there. Uh, we're gonna be going over so much during this talk that I, many of your questions are likely to be answered in the talk. Um, the chat box is open, feel free to chat. We do ask that you do not um, try to make any medical recommendations, prescribing medications, anything like that will be removed from the chat. Um, this is a place that you can kind of talk about your experiences, but we ask that you don't try to um, give medical advice in the chat. Uh, what else? The only other thing I wanna say is that we have a lot to talk about you guys. So this might go a little bit long today. If you're not able to stay for the whole thing, it will be recorded afterwards and you will receive a link next week. Uh, could take 48 hours um, for them to send to you, but you will receive a link so you can watch it um, when you have time. So with that, here's your warning. You're gonna see a lot of poop in this talk. I don't know if you're, if you're coming to this talk and you're not expecting to see a lot of poop, I, you, you've, you've gone the wrong way. This is, this is the last time we're gonna warn you. You're gonna see a lot I'm of poop now. So much poop. Rachel and I have been going through the archives digging through all of our photos and our past text messages and we have a lot to share. So there's gonna be so much poop. No, okay, no. here we are with some poop. This photo was taken a month ago uh, at my birthday party because we know how to party, right? <laughs> Everybody else is in the pool. Is in the pool and we're just hanging out, like, looking at, admiring is not the right word. We're not admiring this poop because this was not good. It's gross poop. This is gross poop. But Rachel, you look really enthusiastic about it. I look a little grossed out. The point is, you know, we know where the party's at and the party is at the poop. We wanna look at the poop. We wanna figure out what's going on with the poop. Um, 
for anybody who doesn't know us, um, my name is Hannah Shaw. I am a kitten rescuer. Um, people call me kitten lady. Rachel, you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, I'm Rachel. I'm a veterinarian. Um, and my areas of expertise or semi expertise, we'll say, um, are emergency medicine, but more specifically kitten medicine. So pediatric and neonatal kitten care. Yeah. And together, uh, we both are, uh, passionate volunteers for our organization, Orphan Kitten Club. Um, so Rachel is the veterinarian for all of my foster kittens. Uh, so we have combined, you know, a lot of years of experience with kittens and kitten poop, um, a very important subject that we're excited to share our, all of our knowledge with you. All right, so how many of you can relate to this? You sign up to foster kittens, you think, this is gonna be cute. This is gonna be so adorable. It's just gonna be snuggles all day. I'm just gonna kiss them all on their cute little heads. And then you look at their heads more closely and you go, is that mustard? <laughs> What is that? Is it supposed to look like that? And then you start like taking a picture and sending it to your friends and you're like, is, does this look normal? And then that's how you find out who your cool friends are. And they're the ones that want to talk to you about this stuff, right? Mm -hmm. um, Rachel and I send each other a lot of poop pictures. Uh, we both, I think, receive a lot of photos that look like this. I would say it's a little bit more one-sided. I feel like I receive more than I give. Mm. Yeah. I do both. I do okay. both. Yeah. Um, but here's, here's a, an example of how, you know, you're a foster parent of kittens. I got this one this week and it made me laugh really hard. Um, so, you know, there's, there's some humor to be had here, but also, uh, and you know, this one's humorous cause it's a good looking poop, but sometimes it's an emergency text that you're, you know, what is going on here? I have no idea, you know, is what could this possibly mean? Um, so, you know, poop really matters and you should care about poop if you're fostering kittens. Um, why should you care about poop if you're fostering kittens, Rachel? Poop is a really, really great way of having disease surveillance. So, you know, a lot of times, you know, because kittens can't talk to us or not in English, at least, you know, assessing what how they take stuff in and how they put stuff out is a really good way to survey them and say, you know, is something changing? Maybe some sort of illness is coming on. So poop is a really good example of that. It's a really good sort of internal dictator of, of uh, medical conditions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And what I always say is poop is like a kitten's report card. Uh, so if you have a child and they bring home their report card, uh, you know, if it's an A, you celebrate and you send a picture to your friends. <laughs> um, if it is a D for diarrhea, you don't celebrate and you don't just, but like if it's a, if it's a D on a report card, you wouldn't just say like, oh, that's too bad. Whatever. They'll probably get better. No. Like what would you do? You would, you would get a tutor. You would try to investigate what's going on. Um, same thing applies for poop. This is literally a report card that comes out of their body and says like, here's how I'm doing. Like either I'm, I'm doing great A plus or like, uh, help, I'm not doing so great. Um, and so you should be looking at your kitten's poop and you should care what it looks like. And not only should you care, you should intervene um, when it doesn't look so good. So we're gonna show you, you know, what's good, what's not good, how to intervene. We're going to be dumping loads of info on you. Um, so these are the things we're gonna talk about today. First, we're gonna talk about normal poop. What is normal? Um, we're gonna talk about poop at each age because obviously it, it actually changes from age to age, like week to week for kittens. Um, depending on what they're eating, et cetera. And then um, the bulk of this talk is about poop problems. Um, so all of the different issues that can be causing some kind of gastrointestinal distress. Uh, we'll talk about diagnostic options, different types of fecal testing. We'll talk about parasites, bacteria, viruses, diet. We'll talk about constipation, we'll cover some congenital conditions, and then um, we'll talk at the end about other considerations, side effects of diarrhea and constipation, other things you should be thinking about when a kitten is having a poop issue. And then at the end, we'll have Q&A. Woohoo! All right, what does normal poop look like? 
Well, there's a lot of different ways that normal poop can look, but here's one example. Um, and we are gonna first talk about poop size and frequency. This was a question that a lot of people asked. Um, how often should they be pooping and how big should their poop be? This is a pretty big poop, but I would say it's also like a fairly normal representation of what comes out of a kitten um, on the bigger end. Um, yeah. And we would say that, you know, there isn't just, there's not a, there's not a standard, you know, yeah. there's, there's not one normal poop, but there's, there's definitely abnormal. So, you know, things you're looking for are color, consistency, or shape, you know, um, and, and, and frequency. So those are things. And, and it changes for each kitten. Shh, sorry, my dogs are, no. Sorry. That's okay. Yes, yeah, so frequency. I mean, like sometimes I have kittens who go four times a day. Sometimes I have kittens who go once every other day. You know, um, and so for me, when somebody says to me, "Oh my gosh, my my neonatal kitten has not pooped in 24 hours," I'm not terribly concerned about that usually. <clears throat> but <clears throat> I think what's more important is what's normal for that kitten, right? Because some kittens go smaller amounts more frequently. Some kittens go bigger amounts like this, maybe once a day. Um, and some kittens go every other day. For me, once it exceeds 48 hours, that's when I'm like, I just want to start like thinking about what else might be going on here. That's when I'm starting to get concerned, starting to like have that little alarm go off in my head. What about for you? Yeah, I would say you know, at the 48 hour mark, that's when we start to get a little bit concerned. Now, that being said, it can still be normal to not go for longer, but that, you know, after 48 hours of no pooping, you're really going to want to check in with your medical team or a vet or somebody. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So size, frequency, it doesn't really matter. Um, it's, it could, it could vary from kitten to kitten, but if something really different happens or if it's been more than 48 hours, just check in. Yeah. Poop color. This is from my book, Tiny But Mighty. Um, and we're not gonna go through all of this. Um, uh, this is just to say that these are some normal colors. So uh, a lot of people are surprised because I don't usually post poop pictures on my Instagram because I'm not trying to like alienate the entire <laughs> myself from the entire internet. Um, but I did post one this week and everybody was like, are you worried that his poop is yellow? And I was like, not at all. That is like completely normal. Um, so a nursing kitten, that's a normal color. Uh, brown poop, normal in a weaned kitten. All these colors, not normal. All right, moving on to form. Here are some um, descriptive words for different forms of poop. We have formed and that's like a solid poop. Soft formed, that looks more like a soft serve. So it's not, it's not like a formed poop, but it has some form to it. You know, it has a little bit. You know, of it's going to sort of fall apart when you're picking it up, but at the same time, like there's a shape to it. Yes. Soft unformed. You have words for this that are gross, right? Yeah, sort of. Yeah that so the soft unform that's more like your cow pat um or like yeah the pudding <laughs> pudding is another one the soft formed the one above we would either call soft serve or toothpaste mm -hmm. where it like comes out and it comes out of the tube the shape, it comes out of the shape of the tube but but it's real soft and sort of loose whereas but down below is yeah you're putting your your cow pat um cow patty and then liquid is yeah. just the runs. Liquid is what it sounds like. Um, so these are different ways that you can describe, like we'll use these words um, in our rescue and we know what it means if you say like, oh yeah, they had soft unformed poop. Um, you should know what that looks like. Um, and in terms of the form here, we should say uh, some of these are not normal or healthy. Liquid is a real problem. Um, soft unformed is also a problem. S sometimes soft formed might be concerning because they had formed poop and now they have soft unformed, soft formed poop. Why? But sometimes 
they had really bad diarrhea and now their poop is soft formed and you're happy because it's on its way to formed, right? Yeah. And, and for soft formed and soft unformed, is it a one-off? Is it yeah. just one time? But if it, if it's repeatable, then we're concerned. And, yeah. and you, guys should get, you guys should get really good with using your descriptors, color, consistency, shape, size, so that that way you're doing an accurate job of, of describing it. Because, you know, sometimes if you're trying to talk to a vet um, and you're trying to, shh, trying to explain, um, it's really important to just have, I'm so sorry, to just be able to, um, to give those details so that we can start to think about what's going on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, a big question a lot of people ask me is like, when do you need to talk to a vet? Like when you're looking at it, if all you can see is its form, when do you need to go to a vet? And I think you hit the nail on the head that like, if it's one time that they have like a soft form stool, that's just, you're just making a mental note, huh? They had a soft form stool. Um, if it's every single time or if it's getting worse, um, or for me, if it's liquid at all, if I see liquid, it's no good. Liquid is not like, wait until tomorrow, wait until next week, see if it gets better. Cause that that's pretty much usually indicating something that's pretty urgent liquid is. Yeah. All right. And one of um, Adrian said, and smell, yes. Uh, mm. You can, smell is helpful as a descriptor if there's like a metallic smell to it um, or like rotting eggs, like a sulfuric smell. Otherwise a lot of poop stinks, <laughs> poop but stinks. you know, but yeah. There, there, are, there are some particular smells that you get sure. unfortunately acquainted with <laughs> where you're like, I, you almost feel like your nose is the fecal test, but you should still do a fecal test. Um, okay, so let's move on to developmental stages of poop. Um, starting with ba -ba -ba -ba, meconium. Mm -hmm. So meconium, I love this photo. This is baby Alice. She was one of my fosters last year and this was her poop. And I thought it was the cutest poop because um, it was like his, her first poop and it was her transitional poop. When I say cute, I just mean, I was like, oh, this is cool for education. I'm gonna take a photo of this for later. Um, so what you can see here is the bottom part of that is like really sticky and really dark, looks super different. And then it transitions into like a more formed yellow um, poop. So the meconium is the first poop of the kitten and it is the like digested materials that they consumed in utero. Do you have Yeah, from the, am from the amniotic fluid that they were in. So that's, you know, they, they normally were sort of eating and drinking or just drinking amniotic fluid. And so it comes out a certain color and you've, this picture is such a nice um, example of, you can see where the meconium ends and where formula starts. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah. But I can imagine if you, if you got your first newborn kitten and you saw this, you might go like, what in the world is going on here? So this is actually very normal looking. So that's called meconium. But uh, we should say normal for one, like the first yeah. poop. One? For one poop. One and done. Not normal if it's like a a big kitten with their eyes open. This is normal for a, a newborn. And just for, once. Yeah, just one time. After that, it will look something like this. Normal formula poop. Um, there's a lot of different ways that formula poop can look. It also depends on what type of formula you're feeding. Um, so the color might vary depending on the kind of formula. Uh, the consistency might vary depending on the type of formula. Um, but more or less, it's going to look something like this, like a mustard yellow color with a formed shape to it. Um, and I really like this piece of art. Somebody, somebody gave this to me, the good poop makes me happy. And, um, we keep that in our, our rescue bathroom. <laughs> I love that. Um, so these are some normal formula poops. Here's another one. You can see the texture of that one looks different, probably eating a different a different kind of formula um, than the other ones. Um, but all of these are not concerning. Normal color, good form. Nursing baby poop. Well, there's no picture of the nursing baby poop here because what happens when a baby has their mom and they're nursing from their mom is the mom licks it up and you usually don't end up seeing 
the nursing baby poop. Um, so I think there's there's different ways that nursing baby poop can look. Um, you, you honestly don't usually see it. Uh, the most important thing to know is that if you're not seeing poop in a baby who is with their mom, you shouldn't be terribly concerned about that because um, the mom is, is keeping them clean, keeping the area clean, and she's actually consuming the stool. Um, but if you have a orphan kitten and they don't have a mom to do that for them, you do need to know that they actually need um, that kind of support through stimulation. Um, so this is baby Ferguson. This is actually my cat uh, when he was a baby. And I wanna quickly talk about stimulating because it's something a lot of people struggle with. Um, stimulating kittens is necessary for the first three-ish weeks of life. It really depends on the kitten. So um, you'll, you'll kind of like be able to tell when they don't need it anymore. They'll start going on their own, um, but usually about three weeks. I brought a little sample friend with me so I can show you how, how it is done. Um, basically, um, I think a lot of people know, you know, when you have a neonatal kitten, you're stimulating them to go potty, right? So you're taking a tissue. I use a, I use a just tissues. Um, you can use toilet paper or something soft. Um, and then you are finding their genitals on their butt and you are just rubbing in a circular motion. When you do that, they're going to pee every single time. So the, the cloth is going to start getting wet and you don't like, you don't like start and then take it away. Cause then they would pee <laughs> on you. And then they would also not like finish peeing. They need you to keep going the whole time. But when they're pooping, you'll see in this photo, I'm actually like right next to their butt and you don't just like start them and then let them go. You actually are stimulating the entire time. Now, maybe that sounds weird because it's like, how do you rub on their butt when poop is coming out of it? You go on the side. So I go on the side and I just am like rubbing and helping them the whole time it's coming out. When I say rubbing, it's not like aggressively, like you don't, you're not trying to like cause irritation here, but you just want to be like gently, uh, just gently stimulating the area until they go. Uh, you'll feel their abdomen start to tense. You might see this look of intense um, concentration in their face like Ferguson has here. They're like, oh. they might make a little sound. Um, and if you feel that abdomen tensing while you're trying to stimulate them, do not stop. Keep going because they're pushing. Like that's them pushing and trying to get it out. Um, kittens don't like pooping via stimulation, um, but they, they need that kind of help. And then eventually you'll start to notice, oh, they're kind of going on their own. They're going on the blanket. Um, Rachel, did you want to talk about, you, you were telling me sometimes people stimulate too long. Yeah, sometimes people stimulate too long. The first thing I want to say is, so you use a dry cloth. I use a, a damp cloth mm. or like a, um, a water wipe, just mm. to try to like mimic mom's tongue so that there's a little bit less friction there's sure. no there isn't a wrong way unless all of a sudden you're getting like crazy skin chafing yeah um, but yeah sometimes people go too long and so you know around three and a half weeks of age you know when those kittens are getting mobile and or you know or three depends on the kitten but when they're getting sort of mobile and moving around I make sure to move a litter box into their area um and so I have people who start stimulating over the litter box, but I have some people who are like, I'm stimulating and they're screaming and nothing's coming out. They must be constipated. I'm, and I'm always like, just check the blankets because a lot of times they're actually starting to go even just little bits or they're starting to pee first and it's, it's happening in the blankets and you're not noticing it. Um, and you're actually causing them discomfort because they're empty. Um, and you know, and you're still trying to stimulate them. Now, that being said, it's always better to err on the side of caution and try to help them. But if you're, if you're noticing stuff's not coming out, um, you're an or feces and they're uncomfortable with you doing it, then they might've hit the stage of they're going to the litter box, but maybe not in the litter box. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Once they start looking like this, they have their like more of their cat shaped ears. Uh, they, they might well be ready to go. And I totally agree. Like using a water wipe is a great idea on the butt. The reason I use tissues to stimulate is more for their pee um, because it, it soaks it up. Um, the water wipe, it just will like, 
he will just get all over. So my, my go-to is like, um, is like a, a half wet, half dry. So that, that way I, I, as soon as the piece comes, I flip it around and I catch the pee and start doing that. But then it doesn't matter. Everybody has their own like. Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Cool. So for litter box usage, um, we're not going to, this is not a litter box class. So we're not going to talk a lot about litter boxes. There's a lot of information out there and on my website um, about litter boxes and kittens. But basically, like you said, around three, three and a half weeks, that's when kittens, three and a half weeks is really like the magical spot in a kitten's life where all of a sudden they're like, I can see really clearly. I'm becoming more coordinated. I want to explore. And that's when I'm like, here's your litter box make it super low to the ground. I really like using these boxes because they can just walk right into it um, and just, you know, have some patience with them. They're not always going to get it right the first time, um, but they're learning, you know, kitten safe litter, time, keep it clean. Okay. That's litter box usage. Weaning. Okay, so this is what a weaning kitten poop looks like. It looks almost tie dye, right? Because they're you're interweaving the food that they were eating, the formula, and the food that they're starting to eat, the you know meat. Um, so you can see that it kind of looks like a combination of formula poop and weaned kitten poop, um, and it might look like marbled like that. Can I just uh, compliment you on the fact that you have so many beautiful transition photos, poop transition photos? No, it's because I always knew someday I was like, someday I'm going to need this. Yeah. So yeah. I feel very affirmed that I haven't just been saving all these photos for my own <laughs> sick pleasure. No, these are beautiful. <gasps> Thank you. Yeah, this one is cool. Um, this one's this one's a cool photo. Uh, so yeah, so that's that's normal. And you know, when I wean kittens, and what I recommend to people is you don't like do a hard stop where it's like now you're a formula baby. As of today, you're a meat baby. Like you know, you kind of you do want to you know introduce them to some meat, then supplement them with a bottle, and give them more meat, supplement them with a bottle, give them meat. Oh, they don't want the bottle anymore. Great, now they're weaned. Um, so you will see kind of this marbling during that time. Normal weaned kitten poop. This is one example of a weaned kitten poop. I think this is one of yours. Uh, yeah. It's brown. It's got form. We love a uh, poop with form. And there's a little bit of softness at the end. You can see there. Um, mm. And that was as my babies were sort of like, oh, you know, their stomach was still getting used to doing that transition. Um, so we'll talk about that in, in a little while about sort of how to help those things, including the transition from weaning. Sure. Yeah. Um, and here's Spud, my kitten who got adopted two days ago um, with his proud poop. Uh, so just to show, I mean, you guys know what cat poop looks like. Normal weaned kitten poop looks like normal cat poop, just a little smaller. <laughs> um, shape, it's brown, it's got form. Um, that's a normal, normal looking does not necessarily mean there's nothing wrong, but um, that could be a good indication that they're pretty healthy. Okay, moving on to the bulk of this talk, we're going to talk about poop problems and goodness gracious, do kittens have poop problems? True or false? All kittens have poop problems, so it's really nothing to worry about. They'll get over it soon. Hopefully. Everybody <laughs> has the same answer to this question. But the reason that I put it in here and the answer is this is false. A lot of people are starting to answer on the chat false. Yes, this is false. Um, so I hear this a lot. People will say like, well, you know, my foster kitten has diarrhea, but isn't diarrhea like really common? And I say, yes, diarrhea is very common, but common does not mean normal. Right. And common does not mean healthy. And it does not mean it's okay. So um, yeah, you're going to have kittens with poop problems. Like you, you're going to have way more kittens with poop problems than without poop problems. But it does not mean that it's, that it's something to ignore. Right. So they won't just get over it soon. Um, you want to be actively doing something about it. Yeah. Fecal examination. This is a, a area where Rachel is going to shine. This is just a quick uh, photo of of looking at poop a little bit closer. This is looking at poop under a microscope. Um, and, you know, what I wanna say here is just that like, just because you see how a poop looks or you read, 
you know, oh, if it smells like this, it's that. There, the only way that you can know what's going on is what, what really is going on is through some kind of fecal testing, fecal examination. Um, so one option is if you have access to a microscope, that is one way people do things. However, 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 there are lots of different ways to assess feces, but really the best way is sending it off to the laboratory. And I understand, yeah, you send it off in a nice fecal container or a bag, any way you want to send it. Um, but um, the lab, you know, the pathologists at the lab are the experts. They look at poop all day, every day. And the other thing too, is that certain poop or certain parasite eggs will be seen on a smear. Some you'll actually have to do a flotation and you'll, it's called a Behrman's float. And you'll actually, it looks like a coffee filter that gets put in and then there's different liquids that get put in and then certain eggs float and different fecal material sinks. And so there's, there's actually, there is a science to looking at poop and you're going to miss stuff if you're doing it yourself, you know? So I don't recommend having it done in-house. It sort of I feel like you're you're gonna do yourselves a disservice, and getting a, a fecal sample is pretty inexpensive. Um, so, and and the other thing is, we're about to talk about several different um, fecal options. You know, um, because I think everyone's used to just sending off a fecal and being like fecal negative, but there's lots of different ways to look at fecals. So yeah, here's our basic fecal. And this is just called ova and parasites. And you can see zinc sulfate centrifugation. So like in this case, what they've done is they've actually put zinc sulfate and then they've, they've spun the poop and separated out these eggs from, you know. The point is it's a lot more complicated than just you rubbing some poop on a slide and looking under the microscope. Um, so this is a very basic form um, and it's not my favorite. It's not my favorite for a baby. And the reason being is that when you often get babies and they have poop problems, um, those babies are often have often come from a rough situation and you want to have a kitten um, who is in a really good body condition when you're testing poop. Not always, but when you're when you're testing poop and wanting to see those eggs and that kind of stuff, parasites know when the body is sort of starving or hasn't been treated very well. And the parasites are like, you know, this isn't the greatest time to start reproducing. This isn't time to start building our families. So what they'll do is the parasites will hold off from producing eggs until, you know, you've had a good two, three weeks of nutrition in these kittens. And that's when you're gonna start seeing on this type of fecal, um, you know, eggs or cysts, but either way, usually right off the bat, one that's just a, that just looks at eggs um, or adult parasites isn't going to be very helpful for you for the for the new kitten that you take on because again, the parasites aren't really reproducing in that state of in that sort of poor state of of body condition. Man, that's so interesting because I, something that I hear a lot of people say and that I have certainly experienced is like, you're like, okay, I got this kitten. They look terrible. I like nurse them back to health. They're finally good. You know, they look amazing. They're five weeks old now. And then all of a sudden you're like, what? They have poop problems. Where did they get it? Like, they've only been in my house. Like, did they get it in my house? And you were the person who taught me. No, it's probably been in them this whole time. But like you said, like it, it can be almost like dormant. It's not, they're not, if they're not reproducing, yeah. it might not if, show up. Yeah. If, if the body is in an underfed state, then the parasites are like, this is not a good state to, to start reproducing. And as soon as that nutrition's coming in consistently and the kitten's growing, then especially coccidia is like, okay, let's start. Let's start. It's a always coccidia for me too. It's always yeah. like the, if, if something's going to happen a couple weeks in. Yeah. yeah. So okay. this is not, so this is, this is not, um, this is not a great test for, for, you know, your, your new kittens that you've just taken on. Now, that being said, we will still get positives, but it's, you're more often to get a negative on just this basic ova and parasites. And someone had asked in the chat, you know, is there a way to set up a lab? And we will, we'll tell you about that. Mm -hmm. uh, 
So this test, yeah. And so this is one of um, Hannah's most more recent kittens. And this is a test that I really like because A, it does what we saw in the last test. It does do that look for any eggs or adult parasites, but it also looks at the antigen of several parasites, okay? So antigen is what is, is actually part of the DNA or the RNA of the parasite. So you don't have to physically see reproduction. You don't have to see eggs, adults, um, parasites. All they have to know is that the antigen just tests to see, are we finding, um, are we finding evidence of, of DNA of these parasites? And so this is a great, great test. So you can see Giardia antigen, you know, on the ova and parasites, they didn't see any Giardia cysts, none, but the antigen positive, which means Giardia is living in there. Okay. And, and Giardia was living in that kitten. I mean, that kookaburra was very bloated, had horrible diarrhea. The reason that we sent this test in was because we just couldn't figure out what was going on. So you're totally right that this test worked really well for him. And this is just a screenshot of an app on my phone um, that shows you everything that's going on. So it's an incredible program to have, um, incredibly easy to be able to send out. Yeah, and this, is, and this, this is one is um, a pretty affordable, uh, a pretty affordable fecal test. Yeah, so this is from having an IDEX lab account. Um, and this, you don't you don't need to know what the app is called because it, it's only specific to the, the lab, but there are two main labs around the United States, IDEX and Antec. And so you can fill, I'm, an, I'm a sucker for IDEX, um, but you know, you can, as a rescue, form an account with them and send fecal samples to them. And they'll give you this app that you can check all your diagnostics on there. And it's also really cheap for you to do that. I think a fecal is like $15. Mm -hmm. And well worth doing. Um, so, you know, uh, we used to bring our fecal tests, like our fecal samples to a veterinarian's office for them to send out and then because our rescue has Rachel, um, we were able to set up an account just for our rescue where they literally come and pick it up. Um, you know, FedEx comes and picks up the sample and a couple days later you have uh, it in your app. Um, so definitely a good option. This is one that we do a lot is the fecal diagnostic profile with Giardia. Yeah, the one thing I wanna say about that is while knowledge is power, I want you to remember that just because you have a lab account doesn't mean you suddenly start drawing blood in your rescue and sending it out or sending out other tests and then taking that information and sort of um, taking that information and being like, well, he has this or he's doing this. You know, I don't, I don't want you to start becoming veterinarians. I want you to work with your veterinarians, but having, um, no, uh, having basically a, an account and sending off things that are appropriate to send off and working with a veterinarian is really helpful. And someone asked, is, is, the, turnaround, is the turnaround time on results an issue? No, we get results um, next day. So, yeah. so the, for this one, we get results very, very quickly. Um, and then the other one that we do, if you wanna talk about is the PCR. This one is more extensive. It's also more expensive. And it also takes longer. This one takes usually like five business days for us to receive. Yeah. You want to talk about fecal PCRs and like when yeah. they're appropriate? Yeah. So this is one that you're going to want a veterinarian to run. This isn't one I'm going to recommend that you run on your own. Um, like I want the veterinarian to give you a go ahead. Um, but what happens is when people think parasites, people think roundworms, coccidia, giardia, and that's sort of where it stops. And parasites, there's way more parasites than that, okay? Um, and there's some parasites that just cause this raging diarrhea that we just can't seem to get a handle on, or like this on-off diarrhea. There's also some bacteria that we see that causes, um, that causes nonstop or ongoing diarrhea. And some of it is simple is as simple as a clostridium, which is really common and found in food. Um, some of it is stuff that we find from raw diet. Some of it's you know 
there's a whole bunch of stuff. And then there's even a virus in there that causes diarrhea. And so these are, this is the more extensive. So this is when we've tested the kittens for, for fecal issues. We've gotten negatives, we've tried our treatment and we're not getting any results. And I have a, I have a step-by-step -step protocol I do for kitten poop. And when, so this is not a test I'm sending out commonly but this, there is definitely a time and a place for this test. And it's very helpful. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Okay. True or false. If a fecal is negative, my kitten doesn't have parasites. Hint, so hint, we this. talked about this. We covered this. So, yeah. um, and, and I also, the other reason that I wanted to put this true or false in here is because sometimes people will say, well, the, you know, the rescue said that they got a fecal and it was negative. And then, you know, well, what, what were they looking for on the fecal? You know, were they looking at just the ova and parasites? Were they looking at the antigens? Were they, was it a PC? Like, what were they looking for? Um, negative fecal could mean a lot of different things, right? Yeah. But also. Sorry, go ahead. And, and the other thing too, is that um, when you're having diarrhea, not you or me specifically, but kittens, when you're having diarrhea and you send out a sample of diarrhea, often it's such fast transfer, don't choke, it's such Sorry. fast transfer of poop through the system that you're actually less likely to get ova and parasites in that sample if you do have, um, if you do have um, parasites. So, um, so yeah, we know that, again, we know that a negative isn't a negative end. And again, the parasites know when the body is in a sort of a state of starvation or a state of crisis, and they don't reproduce at those times. They like baby making when, you know, they have resources. Kind of like a... All right. Okay. I feel like that was really great um, information. And if people want to make an account with IDEX, um, talk to your veterinarian for your rescue. Is that the right advice. Just talk, talk to a veterinarian. Talk to a veterinarian. Shopping for a veterinarian is kind of like dating. It's going to take a while to find that right person. They're not all created the same. Like if you, someone at my clinic yesterday was like, well, what about the skin? And I was like, listen, I'm going to tell you something. I went into emergency medicine, so I would never have to treat skin again. So you and I having this conversation about skin, full stop right here. So same thing, like if you're wanting to talk about, if you want to talk about kittens, great, I'm the person for you. And that's the same thing for lots of different veterinarians. So you have to shop around and you have to find somebody who has an interest and maybe they don't have the knowledge, but they have an interest and they want to learn. And that's, that's just as, as helpful as somebody, sorry, it's a terrible time here. And Rachel is just as passionate about dogs. <laughs> I'm maybe not just as, but like cl close. Yeah. All right. We're going to move on to a question that might sound simple, but I think um, it would be great for you to answer like scientifically, what is meant by diarrhea? What is diarrhea? What is diarrhea? So diarrhea is one or both of a couple of things. Basically, you have super fast motility. So you're having poop move through the gastrointestinal tract really fast. And normally, stop it. Normally, um, you have like a normal movement of the gut. And this allows poop to sit in there and get that beautiful formed shape. And if you're having too, too fast a movement, it's just going to fly right out of there and you're losing some of that shape. Hey lady. Um, and then the other thing is that diarrhea is an increased water content in the poop. So the body is drawing water into the colon. So a lot of times people are like, their belly is so bloated. And, that, and of course it's bloated because what's happening is all the water is being drawn into the colon. So it's very dehydrating on the body because because the, the colon's like, we need water, we need water, we need water. And they're like, I'm gonna take it from here and I'm gonna take it from here. So you're getting these really fluid filled, distended, dilated loops of colon that, and then it's shooting it out really fast. Mm -hmm. That's diarrhea. Great description. Okay, so breaking news, diarrhea has many different causes and therefore many different methods of treatment. I hear probably, 
one of the number one questions ever asked of me is, why does my kitten have diarrhea and how do you treat diarrhea? And the answer is, there's no way to answer how do you treat diarrhea? You treat, you know, the various causes of diarrhea. And you also treat the, the symptoms of diarrhea. Um, but there's lots of different reasons that a kitten can have diarrhea. And we are going to talk about all of them now. So buckle in. There's some really gross pictures coming up. <laughs> Gastrointestinal parasites. Hope you're not eating. Okay. Actually, Rachel is, you know, you know that I've FaceTimed with you, like showing you nasty poop. And I've seen you, you're like eating your dinner, looking at it like, oh yeah, look how gross that is. And you're just sitting there eating. So you get to a point where it's just <laughs> not an issue. Okay. Gastrointestinal parasites. Um, this is a chart from Cornell University showing the uh, common intestinal worms. Um, do you want to talk about worms a little bit, what you commonly see? Yeah, so these are these are the, the most, well, supposedly the most common worms. Round worms are definitely your most common worm, and they come from mob, okay? So stop. So most commonly, um, mom has round worms, and during the, even during the in utero process, this is how the baby gets set up for having these roundworms, which is why, um, I, you know, in different countries, there's different um, guidelines, but even in the UK where I studied um, and in the US, the guidelines have a deworming protocol with pyrantal every two weeks until a certain week of, uh, of life to get rid of roundworms because they're so common and they get transferred inside mom. Okay. So that's the most common. And those are your spaghetti like worms. Mm -hmm. Your whip worms and your hook worms are really not that common and you're probably not going to see them. Okay. Um, not, I just mean, you're not going to see them physically. If you do see them, you're going to find them out on a fecal. Mm -hmm. Tapeworms are really common. These are our grains of rice worm. And that big long tapeworm segment is actually an adult worm that contains little, those, um, see those little like we're going to see, we're going to see real yeah. ones. In Those can be like a ton of tapeworm eggs, but sometimes you'll just see like a lovely little tapeworm meandering its way out of your kitten's butt. Um, and just because the fecal comes back negative, if you see a tapeworm wandering its way out of there, um, they have tapeworms and tapeworms come from fleas and mm -hmm. flea eggs. Okay. So we're going to look at some photos of these now and it's, it's pretty gross. So just a heads up. Um, this next slide is a round worm. Um, these were actually from my puppies. Uh, and I was like, ooh, got to get a picture of that. These are really gross. So this is round worms. And um, I have read that uh, more than 75% of cats have round worms. They do. Yeah. They do, for sure. And um, and someone put a, you know, asked a good question. And, and the thing is that when you deworm an animal, um, like let's say you're giving roundworm treatment, you will see roundworms come out and that's the normal thing. You want them out. Mm -hmm. Um, but you know, the other thing too, is understanding these deworming protocols and knowing that they're, they're not usually a one-time only, you know, it's not a guarantee. And this is why our fecal tests are important to be making sure that we've cleared the infection of parasites. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So those are our roundworms. Tapeworms, like you said, um, usually it's something that in my kittens, if I see that they come in and they are like completely covered in fleas, then that's something that I'm going to be considering as a possibility that they might have tapeworms. And um, this is, I think, the most common one that I see physically, like that I like see a kitten have. Um, this is the adult. Uh, Pregnant. That this is the this adult is, worms. Yeah, the adult worms, the tapeworms. That's really gross. And then this is what is you sent me this butthole picture and I loved it. Um, this is a, like a week ago. You sent me a video actually, but I didn't put the video in here. But they, if you see little rice like grains around your kitten's butt or in the poop and it's like moving. That's or it can be dead and dried out when you find it. Yeah. Um, 
then those are tapeworms. And the, the picture on the other side is, is a kitten that's infested with fleas. You don't have to be a kitten infested with fleas or even have any live fleas on you to get tapeworms because the flea eggs, when you groom them off, end up turning into tapeworms. So people are like, how do they get tapeworms? And number one, like hands down, everyone's like, my cat doesn't have fleas. You don't have to have fleas. All you need to do is have a flea lay an egg on you and it's so much more common than you think. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. All righty. So yeah, so whether they have fleas or not, they can have, they can certainly have those tapeworms. And those, like you said, the round worm, a tapeworm, those are the most common worms that I see my kittens have. But then we have all these lovely, and by lovely, I mean my nemesis in life, protozoal parasites. Um, in my anecdotal experience, these are the things that really are like the bane of my existence. And I feel like, um, affect our rescue, like the most honestly is, is protozoal parasites. Um, and I, I want to make sure I say, and we'll talk about deworming protocol in a minute, but, but a lot of the time, um, you know, most of the time deworming, if a kitten, someone says, well, my kitten was dewormed, so they don't have parasites. Um, deworming protocol doesn't necessarily cover these. Um, so let's talk about some of the most common protozoal parasites. These are not worms. They're single cell organisms. Yeah. I just wanted to say back to your thing. Like if my kitten has been dewormed, like you said earlier, there are so many parasites. There isn't just one treatment. Mm -hmm. You can't cover the whole thing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So coccidia, this is what coccidia looks like super, super, super close up. Um, coccidia, anything you want to say about coccidia? This is what it looks like in practice. It can look a whole bunch of different ways, but it's usually very soupy poop. Mm -hmm. um, and coccidia is a really common one that, you know, when we were talking about earlier that they're doing great, they're doing great, they're doing great. And suddenly you have these really great body condition kittens and then you have diarrhea a lot of times that's when you're having coccidia poop because the the coccidia are like time to get this show on the road and yeah some people can smell coccidia that's in the comments definitely there is a smell to it but i i wouldn't consider that diagnostic okay mm -hmm. yeah and coccidia um like pretty much all of these, it's important to say, like can be spread from kitten to kitten. If you have kittens who have coccidia and they're sharing a litter box with another litter of kittens, that's something that the other kittens can get on their paws, groom, and then end up having coccidia themselves. Yeah. And anything with microscopic organisms, you know, you're wanting to try to decrease the burden of those organisms. So cleaning up poop, you know, right when it happens, as soon as they go to the litter box, have a poop, take it away, really, or like cleaning your litter box very well, um, really decreasing as much of the environmental burden as possible. Yeah. If it's on your floor, <laughs> clean it up. Clean the floor, Hannah. Oh gosh. Um, trying to think if there's anything else I want to say about coccidia. I mean, we'll talk about some of the ways that, that we uh, treat for coccidia. I know people are asking. Um, so someone on here said I had one vet who diagnosed any yellow soupy poop as coccidia. And I was saying to Hannah, like, I often see it as yellow poop, but I see lots of different yellow poops. That being said, yeah, I often find like <laughs> coccidia, I think looks like the, one of the treatments for it, which is Albon. Um, and it's, they're both yellow. So yeah. that's really in my experience, I mean, I think all of all of these kinds of conversations, because I get a little wary of like, I can tell by smelling, I can tell by looking like, because you, you might think you can, but, and maybe you can a lot of the time, but I, you know, we got to make sure that we're like confirming what they have before just throwing. Yeah. And the other thing too, is just because you just because we're, it looks like coccidia doesn't mean that it's not coccidia plus giardia plus blah, 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 plus, you know, so. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But that being said, in my experience with both coccidia and giardia, I do notice that it is more, there's, it's more viscous. There's like a viscosity to it. There's like a mucus 
Yeah, and the mucus you're seeing is because the gastrointestinal tract is unhappy. So when the gastrointestinal tract is unhappy, it produces a lot of mucus. Mm -hmm. And that's mucus is actually a helpful barrier because your gastrointestinal tract, when it becomes unhappy, it becomes leaky. And we don't want bacteria that sits in your, in your GI tract to leak into your bloodstream because that can cause sepsis, which we'll discuss later. Mm -hmm. So your, your colon actually makes mucus, which coats the lining and acts as a barrier against that leaky gut, but it also makes your poop really gross and mucusy. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. All right. So Giardia, this is another protozoal parasite. Um, you're never going to see something that looks like this. Um, <laughs> so cute. I think they're kind so of cool. Cute. Uh, they're definitely not cool, but uh, this is when, what it looks like. When you see under the microscope, they have smiles. They look yeah, like smiling yeah. kites. Like, hey, we're partying in your intestines. Oh, they're so cute. They're so cute. Oh, you're a weirdo. <laughs> this is why we're friends. Okay. Um, but here's what it looks like in practice. Less cute. Poor mm -hmm. little baby. And you can see here, there's, I can see that there's like a way this poop is hanging. That's like that mucus that we were talking about. Um, yeah, and again, it doesn't mean it doesn't mean that they have giardia, but no. this gross liquid poop is definitely an alarm bell that you need to be seeing a vet. Sure. Yeah. If I see something that looks like this, I can be pretty sure that's not just like, oh, you just like ate something weird. I, I look at that and I'm like oh, what is reproducing inside of your intestines right now? Something is not Two right. Little smiling kites. Yeah, that is not right. <laughs> okay, so uh, the one thing I wanted to mention too that we started uh, using sometimes is there are Giardia snack tests available, which you can talk to your veterinarian about. Yeah. Um, so anything you, you want to say about that? Yeah, if you register with like a lab, you can also order these snap tests. So like we talked about with that second lab test where we're looking for antigen, which is, you know, bits of the DNA or the RNA of that, of that um, parasite, that's what these snap tests do. So this one's specific to Giardia, but it's a nice thing to have on hand, you know, for when, like if your protocol is when you intake kittens, maybe one of the first things you do is the first poop sample, you pop out one of these snap tests. Um, and that, that can help you. Um, and it can also hopefully save you some time. And again, just cause they have Giardia doesn't mean they don't have a whole host of other things, but it is helpful in the moment. Um, how effective are these really effective, really, really effective. So things that look at antigens, which is the actual, you know, DNA in the test. Yeah. Um, someone's putting like 95%. So um, anything that looks at actual DNA of the organism, super, super effective, very sensitive, very specific. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. True or false, deworming takes care of all parasites. And what I mean here is, let's say you um, took in a foster kitten or you adopted a kitten and the shelter said they're dewormed. Does that mean they do not have any parasites? False, it does not. Um, for a couple of reasons. One, um, you know, just one round of deworming or, you know, you need to know what the deworming protocol was. Just one round of deworming does not necessarily even um, take care of, of the specific parasite that you were treating for. Sometimes you need to be doing a, a longer protocol, um, but also because sometimes um, a deworming protocol might only be covering roundworms, right? And maybe they have something else. So I feel like we uh, covered a lot of that. Uh, do you want to talk about deworming, Rachel? And you know, there are obviously different protocols for different organizations. I've, I've fostered for a lot of different shelters and rescues in the past, and I, they all have had different protocols. So yeah. before we go on, we have a molecular biologist here who, who put a comment and she said, she just wanted to clarify that the antigen test tests mostly proteins, possibly RNA, but not DNA. That is totally true. The reason I say, um, the reason I say DNA is I, I feel like people understand that if I like, so you you are correct. It does it, it's testing for bits of these of these parasites. So um, sorry, um, <laughs> but yeah, I'm just I'm trying to use it in a, in a way that people understand that yeah. you know that there's there's life in there. 
Mm-hmm. Um, so deworming protocols. There are lots of different protocols. Um, and thank you, Bree. Um, uh, there are lots of different protocols. And um, I can post some of like what the what the standard protocols are that are, you know, what your country actually posts as, you know, the standard deworming protocols. Um, again, some are uh, some are state guidelines. Some are just rescues have decided what what their standard protocols are. Mm-hmm. Um, we start to get into sort of tricky territory, okay? Because when we start giving medicines and we don't know if we have an actual infection, then sometimes we don't give them appropriately. And also we can also build resistance of the body and of parasites to these medications, which means, you know, and we'll talk about this later about why coccidia are so pesky, is that sometimes we, we start to build a resistance and we'll get years where there's lots of resistance to a specific type of drug. Um, and this comes from sort of overuse of these medications or inappropriate use of these medications. Mm-hmm. I will say that, um, and again, this is something that I would talk to your vet about, uh, and I know the cost is important, but I really like Revolution, um, which is a drug called Salamectin. Yeah, there we go. It's on the bottom uh, left corner. Um, and it's a topical, um, it's a topical flea uh, and tick medication, but it also takes care of roundworms, hookworms, whipworms, um, and heartworms. And so, ear mites. And ear mites and scabies and demodex. So for me, it's like one of my like mega superheroes and you know, um, yes, we are starting to see revolution resistant fleas, someone put, and that's true, but I'm actually using it a lot more for its intestinal, intestinal use, Mm -hmm. um, because I know it's this sort of broad coverage that I'm going to get and I love it. But again, um, you know, this is something to go over with your vet. Uh, Mm -hmm. so, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so we have a lot of different things on the screen here before we talk about any of them. I think it's important to say, Medication is always to be used under supervision of a vet. Um, And I am completely in agreement that like just throwing medication just based on how poop looks or smells is not the correct approach, right? Um, So so given that we know that 75% or more of cats have roundworm, that is typically what is meant by deworming protocol. Um, is something that is treating roundworm, um, which is this one here, the pyrantal. Um, And pyrantal typically is starting at two weeks of age. Um, Do you have any other opinions on that? Yeah, so if you have a mom, if you if you tend if you have a mom that's going to be giving birth, then there's a protocol for for starting mom every two weeks, and then the babies every two, every two weeks. Um, And um, and again, they, they should be, you know, we, we usually wait till they're about two weeks old and then that's when we start it, but it's a very safe medication. Now, just because it's a safe medication doesn't mean it's benign or it's like giving water. Okay. Mm-hmm. There are bad side effects that can happen. Um, but it is one that is over the counter and you can get, um, and there, you know, again, I'll post the guidelines on, on pyrantal cause that's a, 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 that's a very common one. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm hearing a lot of people ask like about different brands of pyrantal. Pyrantal is pyrantal. So, you know, there are different like labels, like different companies that might be putting this out. But if it says pyrantal pamoate, that's, that's the, the only thing. issue is that the dosing may be different. So the sure. concentration of the medication may be different. And so dosing it is, is different. Yeah. So that's why you should talk to your veterinarian. And honestly, most people I assume are are foster parents for an organization. You don't have to know any of this. They're going to do it for you. So the organization is going to have their protocol. They are probably going to be the ones administering the medication. So you don't even have to do that. Um, In some cases, rescues will send you home with like a little syringe that has some yellow liquid in it. That's the pyrantal that you might have to give. But in most cases, I mean, people are not going to be dosing. 
Yeah, I don't, I don't, I, but I do get a lot of, I do get a lot of fosters who are quite savvy and they start doing at home medication treatments. And I just want to remind everyone that while some of these may be accessible to you over the counter, they're still medicines and you deciding what to give is technically you practicing veterinary medicine and that's illegal. Okay. So it's really important that you have these conversations and find a vet that you can work with. And you can have a vet that oversees and gives you a lot of freedom to have these deworming protocols, have the medications and, and have it in a safe way. But mm -hmm. you starting to just throw medications at your kitten is practicing veterinary, veterinary medicine and you're gonna do more harm than good and it's also actually not legal, okay? Mm -hmm. Okay, so do you want to talk? A lot of people are asking about coccidia, albon, panazaril. So um, my experience was when I when I lived on the East Coast, we always used compounded panazaril, which is this guy down here on the right. Um, we would get it from a compounding pharmacy, and it was working really well for us. And then. Interestingly, we moved to California and noticed that it wasn't working for us very well here. And so we started using Albon and had a better experience with that. But I'm hearing a lot of people say the opposite. So what is your opinion on that, Rachel? And why might that be? So like we discussed with um, developing a resistance, when something is used really commonly, you know, and potentially inappropriately used. So inappropriately dosed, not given for the right condition, not given for the length of duration that's needed, not retested to make sure that, that the, the infection is actually cleared. So there's, you know, there's the parasite can actually develop a resistance and we start to get a resistance or a lack of, um, a lack of, um, efficacy of these drugs. And, mm -hmm. So I find we actually get it in, in waves of years rather than coast by coast. So you're probably having, yeah, on East Coast, you're having some issues with Panazrol and here, you know, sorry, on issues with Albon and vice versa. Mm -hmm. um, now, um, what I like about Albon over the Panazrils and someone keeps on putting on here told Trazeril, again, the Azrils are usually the same class of medications. Um, then you know what I like about Albon is that it is it is an antibiotic and it has an anti-inflammatory property to, for the gut. And you know, and then we'll talk about this later. But when you have when you have gastrointestinal issues, you have secondary consequences to the body, and one of that is gut inflammation. And so, just using you know, just treating the parasite isn't necessarily the only thing that you need to do in these cases. Mm -hmm. um, but again, your vet will be on watch and know. So like when, when frontline stopped working for fleas here, we knew when we stopped prescribing it, you know, mm -hmm. and when, and someone said, you know, revolution's not working for fleas here. Yeah. A revolution is not really working for fleas right now, but it works for a lot of other things. So we're having to get creative, but Again, this is this is part of the surveillance as vets and being able to say what you're doing is not actually going to help you right now, but there's something else that can. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Anything else you want to talk about on the screen? I, I maybe we want to mention metronidazole. So metronidazole is like one of my favorite medications of all time, um, and. Again, this is veterinary dealer's choice, but as a veterinarian, whenever I have a kitten with diarrhea, they all, they go on metronidazole as like, that's my, that's my first line. It doesn't mean that I'm not testing for parasites. It doesn't mean that I'm not looking for solutions, but metronidazole is a really great gastrointestinal anti-inflammatory. So A, I make sure to dose it correctly because if you don't dose it correctly, you can cause uh, neurotoxicity, seizures, um, inability to walk. You can cause a lot of bad things, okay? Um, and it's really easy to overdose in a tiny, tiny kitten. Um, but it is one of these medications that is in my personal arsenal of tools and anything that gets diarrhea, my goal is to stop the diarrhea. Just because I've stopped the diarrhea or halted it doesn't mean I've treated the cause of it. But my goal is to stop the dehydration, the feeling like crap, the all that other stuff 
while I'm figuring out what's going on. Mm -hmm. So metronidazole is one of my favorites. The other thing is knowing that some of these medications are not approved for kittens under eight weeks old. So a lot of people started mentioning Revolution Plus, not approved for kittens under eight weeks old. Revolution is, but Revolution Plus is not. So Revolution there is for kittens, you know, under three pounds, two pounds, five, sorry, no, that, that one's under five pounds. Mm -hmm. um, you can give to like a newborn kitten a whole revolution tube of this baby revolution, but not if it's revolution plus. Praziquantel, mm -hmm. not for kittens under eight weeks old, technically. So mm -hmm. again, these are things your veterinarian's going to know or look into. Mm -hmm. um, and someone's asking, do I give Albon to tiny kittens? My answer is I give most drugs to tiny kittens. Um, but again, I'm doing it with that veterinary knowledge. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's important. The, the most important thing here is to find a veterinarian who's comfortable with medications in, in young kittens um, and knows what's appropriate. Um, and they can, they can guide you. Not only can they guide you, they're, they're directing you um, what to do. So, um, so the point of, of showing all of these was, you know, kind of to talk about all of it, but also to show there are so many different things that could be parasite uh, caused um, poop problems that all have different types of treatment that you need to talk to a vet about so that you can get the appropriate treatment for what is going on. Um, but now we're going to move on to bacteria. And bacteria is something that when I was getting started with kittens, nobody told me that that could that there could be bacterial infections or um, you know imbalances for kittens, and I think this is something that is less discussed. So, um, what is dysbiosis, Rachel? So. When a kitten is born, its gut is a clean slate. So it's basically free from bacteria. And then traveling through the birth canal, if it goes through, you know, vaginal birth, um, being exposed to whatever's in the environment, all those things are going to affect, and also formula, are going to affect colonization of good bacteria in the gut. But they can also help with colonization of bad bacteria. And your gut is a little microbiome. It's its own little environment of bacteria. And this bacteria, um, you know, if this bacteria is not in the right proportions, this is what we call a dysbiosis. So you can have too much good bacteria. You can have too much bad bacteria, but the, the wrong proportions will cause, um, will cause a bacterial infection, which causes... Uh, an upset stomach and needs to be treated. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So these are some interesting colors here. Definitely put me on alert when I saw these colors. Um, important to say, just because uh, they don't have colors like this does not mean that they are not having some kind of bacterial issue. Yeah. Um, let's talk about some of the uh, bacteria that's present in the guts of kittens and, and what it means when it's out of balance. Yeah. So E. coli is a really common bacteria that is that is in all colons. Um, but too much E. coli or too, or there are different strains of E. coli that cause like um, that cause bleeding of the gut or that kind of stuff can really um, affect a kitten negatively. And so um, again, when you have one gut problem doesn't mean there aren't others. So oftentimes, you know, oftentimes when you have parasites that make the gut unhappy, then you can have this E. coli that's normal to the gut start to actually act negatively on the body. And so then now we have a parasite infection plus a bacterial infection, and we're setting this kitten up, you know, for, for being really sick. And so we need to address these things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, Campylobacter. Yeah, that's a really gross bacteria. And that's one that we're gonna see um, in, these, in these like ongoing diarrhea cases. These are ones that we see on that fecal PCR. You're not gonna, you're not gonna find Campylobacter on your regular um, ova and parasite screen. Um, and Campylobacter makes them very ill and it comes from eating raw meat. 
So, you know, if you get kittens from the street or kittens from an unknown location, they may be harboring Campylobacter. Um, feeding raw to a kitten, you're very, you, you have a high likelihood of giving them Campylobacter um, and it can make them very ill. And same thing with salmonella. A lot of, a lot of raw diets contain salmonella. And um, I'm not gonna have a discussion about raw. I'll tell you my opinion. And that is I don't give raw to babies because babies don't have a good enough immune system to be able to, to adjust their gut bacteria in appropriate quantities. Mm -hmm. um, but the answer is that these are normal foodborne contaminants um, and we, um, we, you know, we don't want them. And the other thing is they, you can catch them and you can become super ill, mm -hmm. super, super ill. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I will just say, um, I don't, I don't feed a raw diet. I know there's a lot of, um, like strong opinions people have for or against raw diets. And, um, the only thing that I can say anecdotally is I, last year, and you remember this, I'm sure I had a kitten with a really challenging GI situation and everyone was giving me different advice. And a couple people were like, just try raw, just try raw. Um, it's going to make things better. And against your advice, I was like, I'm going to try it. <laughs> and you know what happened? Salmonella. <laughs> no, and Campylobacter. Yours had Campylobacter. Yeah, Campylobacter. Yeah. You had both. Um, and I was like, this is, yeah. this is just, this is what I get. So uh, I'm not going to be doing that again, but I know some people do have positive experiences with that. I don't want to negate anybody's experience. No, we're not. And this is the thing again, this is, there's more than one right way to do things. This is just our opinion that comes with a medical background, but feeding somebody, feeding somebody with a underdeveloped immune system, harmful things that contain harmful bacteria is not usually going to end well. Yeah. And, and some people are asking, I just want to say again, in the beginning, we talked about the PCR test. Um, this, this is all stuff that would come up on the PCR yeah. test. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Let's talk about sepsis. Um, what is sepsis? Why does it happen? So like I said earlier, you know, when your gut is unhappy, it starts to become leaky. Um, you know, and someone just put a question about freeze dried raw versus regular raw. If it's raw, it's got the bacteria in it. We're just going to leave it at that. So as far as the gut goes in sepsis, when your gut is unhappy, it becomes leaky. And what that means is that anything that's sitting in your gut, that bacteria that's sitting in your gut, whether it's good bacteria or bad bacteria can leak into your bloodstream. And when you get this body-wide infection, this bloodstream infection of bacteria, that's when you become septic. And in kittens, that happens super, super fast, not only because they have an underdeveloped or almost non-existent immune system, but also because their other organs are underdeveloped to help accommodate. So, you know, in us, if we started getting dehydrated, our kidneys would hold on to water and be like, we're going to happening over there. <laughs> uh, while Rachel is dealing with the pups, I'll just say, you know, sepsis is something that is a leading um I don't even want to say cause of death, but it is, it is one of the primary things you'll see before kitten death is. Yeah. Sepsis. And so, yeah, so normally like if we were getting dehydrated, our kidneys would hold on to water. Now kittens can't, kitten kidneys until four weeks of age can't actually, they can't actually hold on to water. They don't have that concentrating ability. So they dehydrate really quickly. They, they don't have a lot of fat stores or any stores or the, or their liver doesn't even have that ability to convert, um, you know, stored fat into sugar. So they become hypoglycemic really quickly, you know, their blood sugar drops. So all of these things that in somebody who is a little more developed, who has a little bit more of a coping mechanism are really detrimental in kittens. And so they can become septic really quickly and sepsis leads to death really quickly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, absolutely. So in a lot of those cases where people say like, I don't know what happened. They just like were a fading kitten. Like a lot of the time 
that is sepsis. And when a kitten is fading, the process you're seeing is that they're they have sepsis. Sorry about the dog barking. I'm sorry. And so that, that red belly, my dogs, because my dogs are my doorbell. So the um, that red belly you're seeing there, that really red color, we call that injected. And we'll see that, you know, with infection, overwhelming infection. And it's, that's a really, that's a scary sign. The other picture is me with a one week old kitten with an IV in it. Um, you can get an IV in a kitten. You can draw blood on a kitten. It is something that is a, a tool. Um, oh, what did you call the red belly? Injected, injected, like injected mucous membranes. Mm -hmm. But you can, you know, people who are a adept at getting fluids in or getting catheters in can do this in these little babies. Um, and part of it is just knowing where and how, and sometimes when you get a septic kitten, you're not able to. And so we have other ways of delivering fluids, dextrose, that kind of stuff, antibiotics. But I just, I, that picture there is really important because I want you to show you that they're not too little. They're not too little for medicine. They're not too little for care. They're not too little for treatment. They're not too little for IVs. They're not too little. They're just small. Yeah. And, and it's important to say too, like from, from my experience as the person who is not a vet and is looking for a vet all the time, um, you know, if it's the middle of the night and I need to like urgently get a kitten somewhere, I will just call the different hospitals and ask, you know, do you have somebody, do you have a veterinarian there who's comfortable placing an IV in a two week old kitten, you know, you can call and ask and some places will say no we don't we don't do that here and then some places will say come on in, you know, so that's always something you can call and ask. Yeah. And someone's putting here, when you get that bright red belly, what's your crash protocol to save a kitten. That's for the veterinarian. That's not for the rescue. If you have a kitten that is not doing well you need to get yourself to a vet um, because anything that you can do at home is just going to be a Band-Aid um, if it works. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, uh, let's talk about antibiotics in kittens. Obviously, um, this is not something that, and we can't say it loud enough, it's not something people should be uh, making decisions at home, like with myself, whenever I am like, I feel like this is a situation that might call for an antibiotic. What do I do? I pick up my phone, I call Rachel, I explain what's going on. I take the kitten into the veterinarian. You know, like the kitten needs to be seen by a professional and prescribed um, antibiotic medication. Um, but uh, kittens can receive antibiotics where indicated and where diagnosed and-, and um, Yeah. And part of this is also being an advocate for kittens. A lot of this is like, advocating for medical care. And so if you think about where our medical care comes from, a lot of it is, is drawn from human medical care. Mm -hmm. So if we look at babies, human babies in the NICU or the PICU, that kind of stuff, they get IVs, they get IV antibiotics, they get all sorts of treatment. And the same is true for kittens. A kitten is never too small for medications. Um, and on the flip side, if you don't have a developed immune system, you often need greater, you often need, uh, you know, more help. And so sometimes people are like, I can't believe we're using this many antibiotics or this many medications in a kitten. I'm like, they need extra support because they are so underdeveloped. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And someone Ferguson else in this picture is a great example of that. Obviously his was not a GI issue, but he, this is my my little baby who has kidney disease, he would not be alive without the intervention of antibiotics. So um, an important thing to talk with somebody about, um, talk with your veterinarian about. But um, anytime you have a kitten who's on antibiotics, you also want to have them on probiotics. Probiotics um, can be really helpful for kittens in, and I know you love talking about probiotics too, Rachel. Um, I just wanted to talk about this specific probiotic that I use. This is Benabac Plus. Um, and I, I love this probiotic because it comes in two different forms. So it's super easy to use. Um, there's a powder form, there's a gel form, um, and it has seven different uh, micro microorganisms in it. Um, so it is really helpful. We use it in all of our kittens. Um, I really like using the gel uh, these days is my favorite one. Um, so 
when do you recommend using probiotics? So my answer is everything that comes into your care should receive probiotics like the minute it enters. Mm -hmm. Not really, but like usually same day. So my answer is, you know, because we know kittens guts are very affected by the environment and they may not have been set up to succeed, everything gets probiotics. And the other important part to know is that a massive proportion, the majority of your immune system is regulated by your gut. And so having healthy gut bacteria to do that is really necessary. So for me, I, and I use Benabac plus the gel. I, I'm not, I'm not super fond of the powder. I prefer the gel. That's just, again, dealer's choice. Mm -hmm. um, but everything that comes into my care gets a dose of, of, Bene, of Benabac plus probiotics. Mm -hmm. Follow the directions. Cause again, too much good bacteria can be bad. Okay. Mm -hmm. So it's not just like, let me give it. But my feeling is anything that is showing signs of illness can benefit from a probiotic. Yeah. It's not going to fix it but it uh -huh. can benefit because it's one of the things that supports good immune health. Uh -huh. Yeah. And PetAg has a great website um, information on there about how to use it and everything um, on their website. And if you win the giveaway, you get some Benna back. So that's awesome. Yay. All right. Um, viruses, you guys, we have a lot to talk about still. So I hope everybody's like getting a snack. Maybe you don't want to have a snack while we're talking about poop, or maybe you're all like, so used to it now that it's fine. Um, so we're going to talk about first. Yeah. <laughs> we're, we're moving on from all the parasites. We're going to talk a little bit about viruses. This picture makes me really sad to share because, um, when I see this, it just looks like fan loop to me. And again, there are things that can look like this that are not pan loop, but I've experienced enough pan loop that when I see something like this, I get really, really concerned. I immediately wash my hands, put on gloves, put my hair up, put on booties, go into high alert and, uh, you know, try to figure out if, if that's what's going on. Um, pan leukopenia is a virus that can spread extremely easily between cats. Um, and it, I don't know if you want to talk about it, Rachel, it attacks the, the lining of the gastrointestinal. Yeah. So it does, it does two things. So pan leukopenia, which by the way, has a horrendous smell to it. It's the, it's a smell that makes my stomach hurt when I smell it, um, is a virus that is similar to parvovirus in dogs. The two are not usually transmissible, but they can be. So you have to be careful. Um, and the virus does two things. It attacks the enteric nervous system. So the enteric is your gut. So it attacks the nervous system and starts, it starts basically breaking down the lining of the gut and it's very painful. So aside from being very painful, kittens are vomiting and having diarrhea. Um, and there's often blood that's a company in this. Not that you can see blood, but just because you can't see it doesn't mean it's not there. Mm -hmm. The second thing does is it wipes out your, uh, it causes bone marrow suppression. So it causes suppression of your white blood cells. Mm -hmm. So it basically is like, I'm going to give you a nasty infection and I'm going to stop your ability, any ability that you had to fight infection. I'm going to stop that. I'm going to take away your white blood cells, which are, you know, for fighting infection. Mm -hmm. um, untreated, it is fatal. Mm -hmm. um, even with treatment, it can be fatal. Mm -hmm. um, treatment in a hospital has approximately an 80% success rate. Now, I don't love those stats, okay, because that's, that's a, a broad stat, and different years, we get different mutations of the virus. In some years, I feel like everything that gets PANLUC, no matter how aggressively we treat it in hospital, ends up needing to be euthanized or passes away. In some years, we just get very mild infections. So, I don't, I, I, I don't like the stats. What I will tell you is it's very, it's, it, it causes a lot of very sick signs. It is incredibly contagious. Mm -hmm. um, and this is partially why we don't just throw kittens together from unknown backgrounds. And we, you know, we don't just take, say yes to every single kitten that needs foster because we can quickly spread viruses around. Mm -hmm. And, um, and it needs to be, it needs to be aggressively treated or, you know, consider humane euthanasia if you're not going to treat it. 
because mm -hmm. it is very, 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 um, very painful. And yeah, without painful. treatment is, is pretty much certain that they will pass. Um, and, you know, like with any virus, it's not like there is some like pill that stops the virus. It's more like, you know, you're, you're treating symptoms, you're helping manage their dehydration, you're helping manage secondary infections. And someone on here is saying that, you know, they use Neupogen and Tamiflu as well as metronidazole and fluids. And what I will say to that, so Neupogen is something that helps stimulate bone marrow production. Tamiflu is an antiviral. There are there are anecdotal studies on the effects of those. I have used both of them in multiple cases and I have not used them. And sometimes they are helpful, sometimes they are not. I, they're not like a guarantee that this is, there's no one magical cure for it. Mm -hmm. um, there are a lot of surrounding factors. And so anybody who tells you like, all these things, use them, guarantee survival. It's not, mm -hmm. it's not true. Mm -hmm. okay. but they yeah. are cool. and I did see somebody was asking too about nausea and panleukopenia if you see like very smelly diarrhea and the kitten is vomiting and looking lethargic I would obviously that's not you can't like diagnose panleukopenia from that but I would high alert start treating the kitten as if they do have panleukopenia meaning treating them in terms of like don't touch them and then go touch a bunch of other animals, like start okay. taking. Those. And that should, that should be your protocol for all kittens you yeah. take in. So mm -hmm. you're separating them. You know, the, um, excuse me, the incubation period is up to two weeks. So mm -hmm. for up to two weeks, they can be carriers of it. They can be spreaders of it. So when you're taking in kittens and they may not have clinical signs, you can also be a silent carrier and shedder of the virus. Mm -hmm. So that's why Hannah was like, I put my hair up, I put my gloves on, I put whatever. I'm sort of a bit of a psycho like that where any kittens that come in, I'm like gloves on, let's go. Mm -hmm. And like when my, my technicians are like handling kittens, I'm like, did you change your gloves? Did you change your outfit? Did you, ch you know, because we, we act cautiously. Sure. Yeah. And so in terms of diagnosing panleukopenia, the PCR test we showed earlier is one method, but like we said, that takes five days. Panleukopenia, the symptoms of panleukopenia, usually for me, I see the, the most severe symptoms for like three to five days. So with a PCR, by the time you get it back, usually the kitten, in my experience, has either passed away or is feeling better. Um, and so that can be a good confirmatory test, but it it's not like you wouldn't say, maybe this kitten has panleuk let's ask the vet to send out a PCR. And then in five days, if it comes back, then we'll start behaving as if this kitten has pan Luke, right? Yeah. So my answer is if it looks like pan Luke and it smells like pan Luke, or there's a suspicion of pan Luke, you treat it like pan Luke. Mm -hmm. The pan leukopenia snap tests, unlike the Giardia snap tests are not very sensitive or specific. Okay. So you only have in a kitten showing symptoms, your positives are positive but you can have like a 60% uh, amount of, of kittens getting a negative test mm -hmm. and they can get negative and doesn't mean they don't have pan mm -hmm. One of the other things I do to try to rule it in or out is I draw, I draw blood and I run a CBC because I look at the white blood cell count. Cause like we said, it attacks the gut, but it also attacks the bone marrow. Mm -hmm. uh, now that being said, early on in the infection, they may still have white blood cells. So I'm, sometimes it's like day one and day two, and I'm looking for a trend, but anything that I think is suspicious for pan Luke gets treated like pan Luke. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And for our rescue, we do keep the Parvo snap tests on hand. And when I see poop that looks concerning like this, if there's like the vomiting, the symptoms that might indicate that this could be what's going on. We do do a snap test, but like you said, we don't consider if it's negative, it's not necessarily negative, but we, we have had most of the time in our experience, it, it show positive, but I've heard plenty of people. I get tons say, of negative. Yeah. I've heard plenty of people say it was negative and then the PCR was positive. So, mm -hmm. all right. Um, let's talk about feline coronavirus, which is different from COVID. COVID. Yeah. Not COVID. Okay. Um, so coronavirus is actually a really common diarrhea virus in cats. Um, 
the reason it's called Corona is the Latin, the Latin for crown and the virus particles. Sorry, someone's just okay. Okay. Uh, We're all the animal people. Okay, so coronavirus is a diarrhea virus, and a lot of cats can get it, and a lot of mom cats can actually be silent carriers of it. Now, this is the virus where if we don't address it, um, and if we don't support kittens, then they have a higher likelihood of this virus mutating into later on in life what is known as FIP, okay? Um, so someone was asking, did Praziquantel cause FIP in their cats? No, it did not. Um, but so technically there's the statistic is that only 5% of cats infected with or kittens infected with coronavirus have this mutation into FIP later on. What I will say is I don't know. Um, I don't know if that really is a true statistic anymore that, you know, that study was a while ago. What I will say is that husbandry, how you look after and support these kittens is going to make a huge difference into whether that virus is going to mutate because the immune system is really important and supporting these um, immune, uh, supporting, you know, these developing immune systems, supporting the other signs of illness. So like dehydration and, you know, and again, we'll talk about consequences of diarrhea, but supporting these secondary consequences so that even if we can't necessarily get rid of the diarrhea, cause it's a viral diarrhea that we can at least, you know, we can at least help support them and do our best to have it avoid mutating into FIP later. Now that being said, sometimes that is unavoidable and, and it's not a failure on our part it just happens. And someone else did make a, a statement that is correct, cats can get COVID-19, um, but for another talk and another time. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, let's move on to diet and lifestyle. Um, so this is a section for all of those things that are not a virus or a parasite that has come in with the kitten. This is something that um, is ha happening with the care, right? Something that you're feeding them, something that's environmental. What are the things that can impact their poop? One is premature weaning and malabsorption. Um, I'm very passionate about this because I've been taking care of kittens for more than 12 years now, baby kittens. And um, the way that I learned when I was younger is not the way that I do it now. I definitely wean um, later than I, than I did when I was first learning from other people um, because in my experience, weaning can be one of the most vulnerable times for a kitten. You know, people think of like a newborn as being the most vulnerable they'll ever be. But actually I've looked at a lot of um, stats from, from shelters that share their stats and, and that keep stats on, on very young kittens. And a lot of the time, the, the kittens who die in care um, pass away during weaning, weaning time. Um, and I think sometimes that is uh, from weaning too young, the kitten's not able to like properly, um, properly absorb the, the nutrients and they can have like this horrific diarrhea if you're weaning a kitten who's three weeks old. Um, and so I just always tell people there's no rush um, for weaning kittens. I strongly feel that people should, um, you know, let kittens wean in a way that's really natural, meaning like, like they start to become interested in meat, let them have a bite of it, but keep giving them their bottle, you know, let them have a little bit more, but keep giving them their bottle and doing it really gradually. Um, no late, no earlier than four, four, four and a half weeks, but I usually start at five weeks. Um, anything that you want to add about malabsorption or weaning? Well, so weaning, sometimes it's difficult to age your kittens and not everybody's good at it. And so you may be introducing food too early. Try to use the, try to use poop as a, as a help to help gauge you. Now, that being said, when kittens start moving on to meat, some will get diarrhea, you know, does that mean that we, it's okay? Cause you know, they're, changing diets. No, we still need to take care of the diarrhea. Um, but, but, you know, there's going to be a shift in the gut bacteria and how the gut breaks down food. And so 
that's why you're part of why you're seeing a higher mortality rate. Um, and anything that is a, a is new novel stresses the developing immune system and that puts them at risk. Um, mm -hmm. Anything that makes the immune system sort of uneasy definitely um, is definitely cause for potential diarrhea and or other illnesses. And again, this is where probiotics really come in handy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just want a quick housekeeping note. A lot of questions coming in in the chat. We're looking at the chat, but please try to keep questions in the Q&A because at the end, we're going to be looking at the Q&A. So we're not gonna be pausing and answering everybody's questions in the chat unless it's like very relevant to what we're already talking about. If you have a specific question, if you throw it in the Q&A, we'll look at those at the end and we'll, we'll talk through. Um, okay. Food safety is really important. Um, food safety means that you are checking expiration dates on your formula, on your canned food, you know, making sure that what you're feeding them is fresh. It also means food storage. So um, different types of food have different instructions for storage. Some of them can live on the counter. Some of them have to live in the fridge. Um, and, you know, some of them, maybe the expiration date is uh, you know next year, but it says you know discard x amount of days after opening. Um, so make sure that you're thoroughly reading the instructions for what you are providing, and then um, you know following those instructions. Uh, this poop looks really curdled to me, um, which could be a lot of different things, but it uh, seemed like a good photo to use for this. Food yeah, soup. and we talked about you and I when we were looking at this photo. We talked about keeping your formula out on the counter, you know, after you've made it up, like how long is good. And my answer is as soon as you're done feeding should be going back in the fridge, but mm -hmm. also following the guidelines on your formula too. Like my, the formula I use says after you've made up a batch, discard after 24 hours, mm -hmm. which, mm -hmm. you know, if you have one tiny kitten that you're feeding and you're making up formula, you might, you might feel it be like, oh, I can use this for a few more days. And that's not the indication. And you can get, um, you can get a lot of issues and, you know, we talked about this photo because you're in your car and you're on a road trip. And so you may have been doing your best to keep your formula cool until you like cooled, you know, on ice until you needed to heat it up and use it. Mm -hmm. But we may have had some issues with that form, sure. you know, formula. Being and bad. heating and cooling and heating and cooling. People know just from human food safety, if you're heating and cooling the same uh, food over and over again, there can be issues with bacteria there too. So, um, what I do just for like ease is we have like the small blender bottles and I will make up like enough for the next two feedings, the next three feedings, um, you know, make that up, use that. And then, you know, every day, like discard and, and make fresh. I make for enough for my night feedings. And then I make enough for my day feedings, but I always make sure I'm going into night shifts with mm -hmm. pre-made formula so that I'm not like a zombie in the middle of the night. Yeah, um, yeah like you, it, it, you can make it fresh every single time and that is like awesome. But more importantly, it's like, don't make a batch for the week. Don't make a batch for the next three days. No, 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 no. Like just for like a couple feedings is fine. There are directions on it, follow yeah, them. Yeah, for sure. All right, diet changes. Um, this is something that can happen when you have a kitten, let's say like, you know, you have kittens and you're feeding them one food and then you can't find any more of that food. So you switch the food. And then all of a sudden you're like, no, their beautiful poops look like pudding now. What happened? Why do kittens have diarrhea caused by diet changes? So all animals have diarrhea caused by diet changes. And if you don't, you're really lucky, but um, anytime you introduce a new food with, you know, anything that's new causes diarrhea, essentially. So when you're doing a food change, you want to do a slow introduction. So for, you know, like how Hannah was saying, she, she starts her weaning protocol a little bit later. My weaning protocol starts with me introducing a little bit of the, um, of the meat that I'm going to use into the formula so that I'm introducing small amounts of that as I'm feeding them so that by the time I'm ready to start offering it to them on the plate, their gut has had um, an ability to adjust to it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, great advice. And when you're, you know, what we do also with our doctors, um, like 
perfect example. I had an adoption two days ago and I gave them a couple cans of the food that the kitten has been eating. And what I'll tell people is, listen, you can feed the kitten what you want. Like you can choose the brand you like, but first of all, don't do it today. Like, because it's already stressful to go to a new home, right? So they go to a new home and that can be, even if it's happy stress, it's still stress. Um, and then if they're also eating something new, you're likely to see diarrhea. So I try to have them go to the new home, feed them what they've been feeding and then slowly start mixing or like. When we say slowly, like we're talking over the course of a week, two weeks. So like the first day you're putting a morsel in of the new and it's mostly old, you know, really slow, really, really slow. Mm -hmm. um, so stress, I just mentioned um, this poop was a veterinary. This was like a vet visit day. <laughs> And this is a kitten who had a good poop and then came home and did this. And I was like, oh, you were stressed. Like you went to the vet and it was stressful. And um, this is an example of one of those times like earlier when you said, listen, a one-off bad poop, we're not super, super concerned. Um, this was a one-off. It was like, you know, that happens, that happens. You have, you get really stressed. Your body's like, ah, evacuate. Um, and then the kitten was fine after that. So stress can cause can cause some GI upset. Yeah, your adrenaline, the adrenaline that courses through your body, one of the things it makes you do is poop because it makes you, it's it it shuts down um, the blood supply to less important organs and also tries to make you lighter so you can run faster. And so part of that is it's it says evacuate, and so mm -hmm. that's part of your fight or flight response. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Again, if it's just a one-off, it's a one-off. Mm -hmm. All right. Overfeeding. This is something Rachel's super passionate about. Um, I want to talk about both overfeeding and also like feeding, fe feeding an appropriate amount for the kitten's age, but doing it too quickly for a kitten who has been starved. So um, this is an example that I put here. This is baby Ruth. Um, she was one of my kittens, was that this year, last year? What is time? I don't even know what's going on this, <laughs> in the last little bit. And um, this kitten was just so, so anorexic when she got here. She was very, very thin. You could take your hand and put it over her. This kind of looks like her, actually. <laughs> you could put your hand here and you could like feel your finger on the other side of her. Um, so she was very, 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 very thin. And um, your instinct might be like, this baby's so hungry, feed them everything. And um, even while I tried to hold back that instinct with her and just feed her small amounts, this is what she ended up doing to my lap, um, pooping all over me. So why does that happen? And what can people, how do people know like what's an appropriate quantity to feed? Yeah. So the two things is diarrhea is actually the, the, the best case scenario. Uh-oh. Rachel froze. Is Rachel frozen for you guys? Am I frozen? Uh-oh. I'm not. Rachel is. Okay. Rachel, if you can see this, log out and log back in. Um, sorry guys, we will try to figure out what's going on. Um, let me, yeah, thank you guys for your patience. Yeah. Oh, her power went out. Oh no. Well, Let me, let me see what we think here. I have an idea. I could put her on speakerphone. Um, sorry, you guys. Thank you for your patience. Christina, did you have something that you wanted to suggest? Maybe. Maybe she could join from her phone. Why don't you text her? Sorry, you guys. Um, maybe in the meantime, I can 
I know I'm not, I, I'm not Rachel, so I want to let Rachel answer all of the medical questions. Um, show me Fergie. Oh, now everybody's just going to ask to see, <laughs> see Fergie. I think Fergie is in here somewhere. I think he's asleep on top of the... Oh, you guys, I am so sorry. This is already such a long, um, long talk. She is trying to log in from her phone. So we're just going to give her a moment to see if that can work. But I'm happy that you guys are all still here and enjoying uh, this conversation. <laughs> yeah, it, it is over time. We were, we were like 90 minutes. Do we really, can we really talk about poop for 90 minutes? And now I'm like, uh oh, we have a lot. We have a lot of information. Um, I texted her and we'll see what's going on, but. Okay. Well, maybe, maybe I can do some of this on my own. Let's see. Um, I will go ahead and, and continue talking about some of this. And if there's anything that I don't think is appropriate for me to cover on my own, then um, we'll make sure that Rachel gets to talk about it. Uh, I know she's very passionate about overfeeding as an issue. So I'm going to let her um, address that when she gets back on. This was an example of, um, a kitten who was a real mystery to me. We were really confused. We saw um, like, like particles of something in his stool and it ended up being that he was eating litter. Um, so sometimes you might see that there, she's downloading Zoom to her phone. <laughs> sometimes you might see that there are um, like actually like particles of something in the stool. I think that's pretty rare, uh, but it's something that I wanted to share and call out. Uh, this is one of Rachel's uh, stool pictures that she shared um, just to show that sometimes a positive change in nutrition, you're going to see that change. Um, this is a kitten who was living outdoors on the street and was probably consuming all sorts of um, things that they're not supposed to be consuming. So sometimes you see, you can tell that this kitten's been eating, um, you know, sometimes trash, dirt, um, like this looks very, very abnormal and then goes into um, a more normal looking stool. So that's what's going on in this one. Um, here's one that I would love to talk about, which is uh, something I hear a lot is people say, well, you know, if you give them wet food, then their poop is gonna be more wet. If you give them dry food, then their poop will be more dry. So the question is, does eating wet food increase the risk of diarrhea? Oh my God, there she is, Rachel. She's joining. Hi. Hey, can you see Hi. in here? I can see, yeah. I, I'm so uh, sorry about your power. I'm so sorry, you guys. No, it's okay. I'm gonna continue, I'm gonna finish talking about this and then we're gonna go back to overfeeding for you. Okay, sounds okay. good. So this is just a true or false, um, but it, yeah, it's false. Um, but I just wanted to say like with nutrition, um, what horrifies me is the thought that somebody, if somebody thinks, oh, they have diarrhea because they're eating a wetter diet, just give them a drier diet and they won't have diarrhea. That is definitely false. In fact, it could be a really harmful thing to be removing, um, moisture from the diet of an animal who, uh, is dehydrated from having diarrhea. Um, so, so that is definitely False, but let's move back to um, overfeeding so that Rachel can chat about that. Um, so, <laughs> sorry, you guys, and I can't see myself, so I, I don't You're, know. You look beautiful. Thank you. Um, so, you know, overfeeding, um, diarrhea is the best case scenario that the, of, a, of a consequence. When you have a body that's been starving and you suddenly give it all the things, all the nutrients available to it, you can actually cause a shift in electrolytes and other, um, other blood parameters, and you can actually kill them. Um, and it's very easy to do. You can, you can cause like there can cause a shift in their phosphorus levels, and that can actually cause busting of red blood cells and you can bleed to death internally. You can give too high potassium, you know, there's lots of different things that can happen. And so if you are getting a very malnourished kitten, 
um, who's been in a state of starvation, it's really important to talk to your vet about how to do a slow introduction to nutrition and calories. And that is something that your vet's going to have to do because it's changes based on the diet and what type of calories are available in the diet. Now that's, that's for like a severely, um, you know, anorexic kitten that you've gotten now for, for general kittens. Yeah. Most of them don't come in the greatest body condition. So when you're introducing them to food, you want to allow them to eat, but you don't want to, you know, sometimes kittens will gorge themselves, especially if there's competition with their other, um, with their litter mates, or if they haven't had that much access to food. So a lot of like street kittens I get suddenly they're like, and they're pushing their, you know, their friend out of the way. And they're just trying to eat all of it as much of as possible. And that will just cause diarrhea. So sometimes limiting that volume that you're feeding to what should be an appropriate stomach size. Um, and I know Hannah has some resources about on stomach sizes um, and even kittens that you're bottle feeding that haven't been eating that much, you know, doing a slow expansion of the stomach with calories is really important. Otherwise you're going to get negative consequences. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So again, if you have questions, finding a vet that you can, um, you can help guide you on that, but also Hannah has definitely has some resources she can talk to you about on, um, what an appropriate stomach size is for a kitten of a certain age. And yeah. Yeah. I have it in my book. I think I have it at kittenlady.org slash bottle feeding as well. Like a stomach capacity chart. Um, let's talk about constipation. Are you able to see the slides, Rachel? Yeah, I can see the slides and I can see you. Awesome. Okay. So, um, we're going to talk about constipation and I'm going to ask you the same thing I asked about diarrhea. Can you explain scientifically what is constipation? Yeah. So just like diarrhea, we were talking about the speed at which things were moving through and the amount of water in the gut. Um, constipation is sort of the opposite. So we can either have really slow motility. So not really moving through, um, very quickly or, or delayed, um, or something affecting it moving through. And the other thing is again, not enough water in the gut. And so use again, like we talked about earlier, kittens, aren't really great at concentrating their urine because their kidneys are underdeveloped. So they're not great at keeping hydrated. And one of the areas of the body where your body takes excess water and uses it because it needs it is from your colon. So sometimes poop gets really dehydrated because the body's like, we need this extra water that's sitting in there and it steals it back. Um, and so you can get that sort of constipation. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. So this is a picture of what constipation might look like. A lot of the time you'll see stool that is like broken into little balls. Bunny poop. Yeah, bunny poop. It's like hard balls that are coming out. Um, this is another example. It looks almost like, I always call it like a plug. It's like they have like a plug at the end of their butt and it like, you finally get it out and it is painful for them sometimes. They can cry, it can be um, quite uncomfortable. Um, here's an example of a kitten who was constipated and then became not constipated. Yay. Um, so you can see it's got some of those like firmer balls at the end, and then, um, it's going into a more appropriate form. So yeah. formed poop is good, but we don't want it to be so hard and rigid, um, that it's uncomfortable. And sometimes with, um, with formula for constipation or just knowing that you're, that you're maybe going to be verging on constipation is sometimes you'll see the form, the poop will look like little mustard seeds, like little yellow mustard seeds. And those are technically like little bunny poops, constipated poops in there. And it, it probably means you're not, um, you're not making up your formula with enough water for the needs of the kitten. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. This one's all you, Rachel. Inesmus, one of my favorite words. Okay. So a lot of times we get people who are like, my kitten is constipated and they're not actually constipated. They are straining to go to the bathroom. So this is sort of what tenesmus represents. So you'll get a kitten who has had diarrhea and then they go into, or they've had loose stool and then they go in and out of the litter box and they're straining to poop and nothing's coming out. And it's because their tush is on fire. 
okay? Their guts are on fire, their tush is on fire. They feel like they have to go, but there's nothing left to physically go. And so people will come and say to me, they have constipation. And I'm like, nope, they have tenesmus. So they're straining. Um, and that's a really common thing. Now, that being said, on the flip side, we will sometimes see tenesmus with constipation where they're straining to go. And we're actually getting dripping of like, some feces or mucus out of around because the body's trying to lubricate and pass it through. Um, but just being aware of the distinction of like your cat had diarrhea and now it's straining is not constipation. Mm -hmm. It's just irritation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So obstipation, um, which is kind of like the, a more severe, severe, situation. Um, this is something that occasionally you deal with and that can become an emergency in a kitten. This is Jimmy. He was obstipated twice in my care. Um, and, uh, this is him straining over the litter box, extremely uncomfortable for me. I could actually feel when I like palpated him, I could feel that his colon was full of stool. Um, like I could feel hard poop in there that was not coming out and not nothing I was doing was, was able to get that out. Um, but this was the photo that I wanted to show for him because this is his backside. And um, sometimes it, like you said, it might seem like some stuff is coming out. Um, it might seem like, oh, this is a kitten with diarrhea when actually um, that's kind of coming out around, around a very hard, stool that is not able to pass through. Um, so can you talk about obstipation? Yeah. So obstipation is when constipation has been left too long and we get this backup of feces in the colon and it starts to back up because your colon is very long. So is your small intestine, which is your, your higher part of your intestinal tract, but the, the poop starts to back up and then there's not enough space for it to go. So it starts to widen as well. And um, A, it becomes quite dehydrated just sitting in there. So when it loses water content, it's even harder to get it out. But the other thing too, is that it's causing stretch to your colon and the muscles in your body and your colon is one of those muscles. Um, your intestinal tract is one of those muscles rely on nerves to um, a nerve conduction to remind it to, to move in a certain way. And when you stretch, so normally I, I need to put my phone down to sort of show you what I'm doing, but can you see my hands? Mm -hmm. So normally all your nerve endings touch other nerve endings. And it's like when you do a wave at a baseball game and when the wave starts, it tickles it and it tickles this nerve and this nerve tickles the next nerve. And it's like, oh yeah, we gotta, we gotta move this way. Now, if you stretch the colon, the nerves get separated and this nerve's waving, but this nerve's like, I don't feel anything. I don't know you're there. So you start to actually even lose that ability to start pushing through because your nerves aren't able to talk to each other. Mm -hmm. So there's a, a few things that happen, but basically obstipation requires medical care. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. So in this situation with Jimmy, it was like, I could see that he was straining. I could feel that there was something very hard and large in there that was not passing. I knew he was not pooping from observing him. And I could see that there was some diarrhea leaking out that he was in severe distress. And so in his case, we had to bring him in for deobstipation, which is a medical procedure. And you will often need x-rays to confirm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So um, deobstipation, is a medical procedure. You can bring a kitten in to see if that's something that they need, but it could become kind of an emergency situation. James is another kitten who had that. He had, I think he had two or three different deobstipation, like over the course of one hospitalization. Um, and then he ended up uh, getting the very, very last of that hard stool out through um, an enema. And that is the last little plug that came out of him. And I took that picture because I was so happy because after that, everything else that passed through was normal, which was incredible. Um, so deobstipation, anything you want to add about that? I know that we have still a lot to cover and it, we've already been talking for two hours. So um, deobstipation essentially 
is often a variety of methods to break down and help re relieve that stool. And in um, a lot of times we'll have to sedate the kitten. We'll have to um, use our, our a gloved finger and help move some of it out in combination with enemas. And we do this. Now, the one thing about constipation and, and obstipation, anytime you stretch the colon, it causes nausea, okay? And it causes discomfort. And so just be aware that these are things that also need to be addressed. And we'll talk about that again later on the slides, but this isn't just one off on its own. Um, but yeah, uh, anytime a kitten is really backed up, nausea is something that needs to be dealt with as well. And so it's a, it's a big mainstay of our treatment. Mm -hmm. um, before we move on, I just want to acknowledge that it's been two hours. We've been talking now. This was uh, advertised as a 90 minute talk. We actually still have quite a bit that we're going to be sharing. So I just wanted to say, um, if you're not able to stay, that is okay. This is going to be shared later, but we do want to make sure that we're able to provide all of these resources in one place. Um, so we will continue talking. We will still do a Q&A at the oh. end. It's just, um, we just have a lot to share, you guys. We got a lot to talk about. So enemas, um, enemas are something that uh, can be really helpful for a constipated kitten. This is probably my favorite poop photo I've ever taken. Um, I only mildly posed this poop, but it did come out like this. Um, and I was like, that is the happiest poop ever. And it was a very happy poop um, because it was a kitten who really, really needed to poop. Those were like the little plugs that were stopping it from coming. And then once it started coming, it was like, here we go. And then she was good after that. So um, do you want to talk a little bit about enemas? These are things, obviously an enema, you can take a kitten into the veterinarian, they can do an enema yep. for you. Um, but it is also, would you say something that if you are like a very experienced person running a rescue, you could ask your veterinarian to teach you? Yeah, as long as you are receiving lessons, um, then enemas are something that you potentially could do at home. They're really important. Um, it, like any medical procedure, um, it's really important that you have a, a knowledge and you are trained on how to do them and that you're trained by somebody who has knowledge on how to do them mm -hmm. um, because there's a certain amount of, of liquid that you can instill. There's a certain amount of things you can instill into the liquid. You can also, if you inappropriately use the tube, you can... Um, poke a hole through the, you know, the colon, there are, there is damage that you can do with enemas. So it's really important um, that you get to learn how to do them. But if you learn how to do them, then you definitely can um, have this as a tool. It's definitely not a first line treatment um, for, it's not a first line treatment for constipation, um, but something to have as a skill set. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And um, I want to echo like it, it would really frighten me for people to walk away from this thinking that the appropriate thing to do is to just like start shoving stuff up a cat's bum. Like if you're not trained, that's really dangerous. Um, but it is something that you can be trained on and um, under supervision you can do and can make a really big difference. Um, I think this was just a warm water it's just warm water enema with a um, red rubber catheter. Yeah, so. and and also just having a, a um, having a soak, you know, a bum bath, mm -hmm. having a soak in water um, is Plays also the legs. Yeah, very helpful. And someone just asked the question, "What is a go to for constipation?" Just like parasites or just like diarrhea, there isn't just one go to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Um, however, we are going to talk about um, laxatives because it is something that comes up anytime you're talking about constipation. And Rachel, you taught me something really interesting about lactulose and how it works and why it is not um, something to just like take super lightly, right? Um, like it, it has a place, but also there's a specific time and place and way that you use it. Yeah. Yeah. So like we talked about before, um, I feel like I keep saying that, but latch, you know, 
your colon has a certain amount of water in it. And if, if water gets pulled from that colon and dehydrates the stool, then one of the things we use is lactulose. It's called an osmotic diuretic. And what it does is it draws water back into the colon, but that water's got to come from somewhere. And so what you're actually doing is you're dehydrating. You're going to be dehydrating your kitten and you're also going to be causing abdominal bloating and distension. So those are things that you need to counteract and support. So some people just have, you know, lactulose at home and give it willy nilly every time they're like, oh, my cat's straining. Obviously it's constipated. No, it's not to be given lightly. Again, when you're choosing a medication, you need to be under the guidance of a veterinarian because otherwise you're practicing veterinary medicine. And aside from the fact that it's not legal, you're also doing a disservice to your kitten. The second thing is if you're using lactulose, then you should be using sub Q fluids in addition. Um, and you can give too much sub Q fluids. So learning how to give sub Q fluids and what appropriate volumes are, are very important because you can give too much fluid and actually push a kitten into heart failure. So I want you to be scared. Um, and I, I want you to be, um, I want you to be scared to the point where you get information and you learn how to do these things appropriately. And then when you know, when you have that, these are great tools to have and use, but just know that if we're going to try to induce poop, we are trying, we are actually dehydrating the kitten from the inside. And we need to, we need to, um, we need to accommodate for that. So these two go hand in hand, fluids and latch. Thank you so much for that. Because I, I think that's not something that I originally understood when I first was, you know, the, I think the first time that a vet gave me lactulose, it was like, oh, this will make them poop. Right. And then I remembered it was talking to you where you were like, hang on, hang on, hang on. Like, yeah, that will make a kitten poop, but at what cost and how do we compensate for that? So and so are they really constipated? Are they really constipated? Because a lot of people are like, oh my God, they haven't pooped in 24 hours. I don't know. And, and they just reach for the lactulose. And I'm like, mm -mm. Oh. no. Yeah. Okay. Man, we still got a lot of stuff to talk about this. I think we can go through a little bit quickly. Just yeah. talking about bleeding blood in your poop. That's not good. Blood does not belong in your poop, okay? This is upper GI bleeding. Um, it looks really, really dark. It looks like black, tarry poop. And then here in the middle, you see it's like, it's fizzing. That's because I've put um, hydrogen peroxide on it and it fizz, which is like, ooh, there's blood in here. Um, okay, so that's not good. Blood, not good. Anything to add oh. about that? Go to a vet. Go to a vet. Or GI bleeding. This poop is really red. That does mm -hmm. not look normal. What do you do when this happens? <laughs> Go to a vet. Go to a vet. <laughs> Irritation. Okay. Yeah. This kitten has a bunch of um, blood coming out of their rear end. What do we do? So <laughs> consult your vet. Um, and this time you can also just see if this is a one-off. All right. So sometimes, you know, you can have a kitten who is straining and it bursts uh, some of the blood vessels in the, in the terminal rectum, and you can get a little bit of blood from the irritation. If this happens more than once, go to a vet. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, cool. If there's blood in your poop, go to a vet. And well, if there's there blood you. in your poop, go to a doctor. If there's blood in your kitten's poop, go to a vet. Don't call me. <laughs> Don't call Rachel. <laughs> That's someone else's problem. Yep. Okay. Um, we can quickly address some of these, you know, congenital conditions are not going to be as common, as common as like parasites, viruses, things like that, but they can happen. And certainly people who are in here who um, work with rescues or our foster parents are going to occasionally encounter some um, congenital conditions. Um, so this is one that both of us have, I think, an interestingly high amount of experience with is Atresia ani, which is, um, we had a piglet with it uh, earlier this year. Um, a lot of people are born with it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, but basically where the, there's either very little or no connection to the terminal rectum. So. Yeah. So the inside and the inside don't connect. Mm -hmm. Um, and this requires a surgical procedure 
to mm -hmm. fix it. It is fixable. There mm -hmm. are other things that can can um, happen. In this kitten, I poked a tiny hole after numbing the area. And so you can see fecal staining like dripping on the back end. Um, but this is not something, this is something a vet needs to handle. Oh, um, but you should be examining your kittens to make sure, you know, when you're simulating them, if they're not pooping, you should be examining, do they, do they actually have a connection? Mm -hmm. um, it, could be very, the, it could be very small, but if you're not getting poop out of your kitten, that's an emergency. Sure, yeah. Or if you look and there's literally is not a rectum. Right. Um, which can happen. Um, that's, that's like a right now emergency. Yeah. yeah. Mega colon, a little bit more common than atresia ani. This is a x-ray that you provided, Rachel. Um, there's, you could probably do with an entire hour on mega colon, but um, you want to give the quick overview. Okay. Like we were talking about in obstipation, the poop gets backed up and it starts to stretch the colon. And so the stretching of the colon can become so stretched where that nerve function stops and you don't have that connection. And then you just get mega colon. Um, and that needs to be treated by a vet. The other thing is there are other underlying conditions that can cause mega colon. Um, one is dysautonomia. So there is, um, there's a lot of reasons why mega colon can develop and they're not all treated the same way. Although getting rid of the poop is one of the ways we need to treat it. The important thing to know is that when you have poop sitting in your intestine and just sits there, that's bacteria that can leak. Um, it can leak in and out of, um, in and out of the colon into the bloodstream and predispose them to getting pretty ill and then leading to sepsis. And then I keep seeing this comment that's been going through for the last two hours. Mammals don't have cloacas. So we can stop with cloaca. <laughs> we will not talk about a cloaca. Well, if they, if they have a cloaca, just make sure that it's not actually a bird that you're treating. <laughs> or a lizard or something. So yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, okay. Manx syndrome. I want to um, thank Kitten Factory. Um, she's a foster parent in uh, Michigan who provided me with this photo. I, she actually posted this this week and I sent her a message and said, I would love for us to be able to talk about this. Um, so can you talk a little bit about Manx syndrome? What is it and what impact might it have on the um, gastrointestinal system? So Manx syndrome is when you have basically these kittens that are born tailless or with short tails. And oftentimes what happens is, and this can also happen if they have like an injury to the to the tail um, really close to the rectum. And we have either a non-production um, or a poor production of the nerves that conduct to that area. And you need nerves in that area to help push poop out. And so often these kittens that are born with the, you know, Manx kittens with the short tails can have a difficult time pooping. And so then you start getting backed up poop, you get obstipation, you get megacolon, um, and so these are motility, these are, these are motility issues because we have an issue with the nervous system. You can also see the spine, you know, over the chest, there's kyphosis of the spine there too. Um, you can have other congenital deformations of the spine, but basically this is an issue of, um, our nerves are, are not really well developed in the area where you need them to be developed to push poop out. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, fecal incontinence. Um, I think that, you know, we when we were preparing this talk, you said a lot of people think that their cat is incontinent when they are not. Um, true incontinence is, is more common in cats who have paralysis, um, which I've had a couple. This is one of my former fosters, Tilly. Um, and uh, what do you want to say about fecal incontinence? I mean, it, 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 can present an issue in, um, in kittens with paralysis, but it's absolutely something that can be managed. It's something that can be managed. Also understanding that you have to be a very special type of person to manage it. You know, it's not easy to have an incontinent animal and incontinence refers to the inability to control when things are happening. Now, that being said, if your kitten is leaking diarrhea, that's not, that's not fecal incontinence. That's something that needs to be addressed. That's probably a bad diarrhea issue that needs uh, a workup. Mm -hmm. um, but with fecal incontinence, 
Um, one of the, one of the things you'll see is potentially lack of anal tone. And I have a lot of people who are like, there's no anal tone. Uh, if you see a puckered butthole <laughs> or you poke a butthole and it contracts, that's mm -hmm. anal. tone, So that mm -hmm. can help. Mm -hmm. uh, but if they're not able, if they're not aware of when they're going to the bathroom and they also don't seem to have control of when they go to the bathroom, then that can be fecal incontinence. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And in those cases, um, and in any cases where there's a congenital issue that is resulting in difficulties around using the litter box, going to the bathroom, I just want to say, you know, there are a lot of modifications and accommodations that can be made for these animals. Um, James being one example where he, you know, does not have fully formed back legs, but um, we were able to come up with a bunch of different, this was when I was in the trial phase of trying out like litter on a pee pad, like a cardboard box with a pee pad in it. Um, there's a lot of different things that you can do, including diapering for cats um, that uh, will allow a cat to live a happy, normal life, even if they're not able to use a traditional litter box. So um, can't go through every single thing right now that you can do for them. But um, I, I want to call out a group that's been very helpful for me on Facebook um, called Cats with Paralysis and Mobility Challenges. That is like a real wealth of um, information from people who have cats and kittens with uh, mobility challenges that they can help you find um, appropriate accommodations for for different situations. So um, let's get, let's move on to other considerations. This is our last section and then we're going to be able to finally do the Q and A. So I wanna, um, the, first of all, thank you all for staying for this long. If you thank have you. questions, they're gonna be in the Q and A box. In Zoom, yeah. there are two different boxes. There's the chat and then there's the Q and A. If you want your question to be seen by us, please make sure it is in the Q&A and we'll be going through and we will not be able to get to every question because I can see that there's already more than 99. Um, but uh, we will go through and we'll pick some questions that were things we did not already address in this talk. Um, okay, dehydration. We've talked about dehydration a lot. It felt important to put here because um, dehydration is something you should be thinking of, I mean, I'm thinking about it all the time in kittens, but it's something I'm especially thinking of in kittens with any kind of poop problem, because whether they have constipation or diarrhea, we need to be thinking about dehydration. Correct. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yes. so um, some options for kittens with dehydration. One is just like in increasing their oral hydration. You can use Pedialyte in place of water in their formula. Um, you can add some water into their wet food if they're a weaned kitten. Uh, if you are trained to do so, you can do subcutaneous fluids. Uh, if they're a severely dehydrated kitten, you can take them to a veterinary hospital for IV fluids. Anything else to share about dehydration? I feel like we've covered a lot. No, I think, I think yeah, you're good. Yeah. Take it seriously. But it's a, it's, dehydration is a big deal. Yeah. And dehydration, I guess I should say dehydration can kill. Um, kittens are more prone to it. And um, if you're giving sub Q fluids and that bubble isn't disappearing, they may be at a stage where they're too dehydrated to actually take in fluid from the subcutaneous area. Mm -hmm. You need a vet. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, at a certain point, you do need to go get IV fluids. B12, we love B12. B12 is an awesome vitamin supplement that can be um, really useful for kittens with um, gastrointestinal distress. And why is that, Rachel? So the short answer is um, bacteria can destroy B12 in your gut and B12 is really helpful for absorption of nutrients and proper gut function. And so a lot of times kittens with gastrointestinal infections have imbalances in their um, B vitamins and then their ability to absorb. And so B12 injections, again, with proper teaching and amounts and that kind of stuff are really helpful when you have a kitten with gastrointestinal issues. Great thing to ask your vet about. Um, bloating and gas. These photos just make me so sad. Oh my God. They look so uncomfortable. Um, I can tell you what's going on here. We got Giardia on the left and Coccidia on the right. And the cousin of both of those is bloating and gas. 
So fluid, when you have diarrhea and you have gastrointestinal disease, fluid is pulled into your colon. Your colon's in your gut, so your gut swells and it gets all nasty. (laughs) And so there's not one necessary cause, but it is suggestive that obviously there is a problem and there's a problem that needs investigation and treatment. Mm -hmm. Remembering that bloating and gas is uncomfortable for us. It's uncomfortable for them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so, I mean, the treatment for, oh, look who it is. It's Fergie. Um, Fergie. He just woke up from his nap. Um, so the, the treatment for bloating and gas is treating the cause of the bloating and gas, right? Um, and there was something else I was going to say. But it's also an underlying yeah. issue. Exactly. Treating it's an underlying problem, yeah. Um, and then also I was going to say, there's a difference between um, like a healthy, squishy, lovely kitten belly that's just kind of like a big kitten belly and like a severely bloated, usually a bloated kitten is going to feel kind of hard. It can, it can Mm -hmm. feel kind of hard. You know, you may feel loops of bowel, that kind of stuff when you're palpating them Mm -hmm. either way, get, you know, getting yourself used to normal degrees of normal will help you with what's not normal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Pain and nausea. We talked a little bit about these, um, but maybe just important to add that these are things that can be addressed with veterinary support. Yeah. Pain and nausea should be, and and they should be addressed. They will greatly, you know, when, (laughs) for anybody who has ever had diarrhea or, you know, gastrointestinal issues, you will know that you feel terrible. Mm -hmm. Your stomach is crampy. You feel bleh. You probably don't feel hungry. You may feel nauseous. Um, and just because a cat, a kitten hasn't vomited doesn't mean they're not nauseous. You know, there's lots of times we experience nausea and don't actually vomit. And so advocating for your kittens that they are uncomfortable is really important. And they are perfectly fine little beings to receive both pain meds and nausea medication. And one of the side effects we know of pain medication is that it slows motility down. So anybody who talks about opioids knows that constipation is a side effect. Well, in the case of extreme diarrhea, like in panleukopenia, it's not a problem to have a medication or it can be actually helpful to have a medication that causes a little bit of constipation. It's not going to, but it's it's definitely going to help slow things a little bit. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Thank you for that. Fecal scalding really quickly, just keep your kittens clean. If they have diarrhea, it can get kind of like stuck back there. Um, and you want, you want to use those wet wipes, keep it really clean. Um, obviously like just because that's a more comfortable and pleasant thing for them, but also because when diarrhea is stuck to their fur for a prolonged period of time, it can actually like scald the skin and, and make the fur fall off. Um, and you can end up with something like on the right here where the skin is really raw, it's uncomfortable. And then what can happen when you have raw open skin with um, poop all over it, you can get you know, unco- like infections and, and a lot of discomfort back there. So keep things very clean. Even if this happens, you know, just you can give them a little bit of a bum bath. You can wipe them down gently with a wet wipe. Um, and then if this occurs, um, SSD. Yeah, silver sulfadiazine, silver cream, um, which is like your burn cream, which is fantastic. And the other thing to note is that if you're constantly having poop dripping down, you're predisposing your kitten to urinary tract infections. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Great point. Poop explosions and butt baths. Oh my God. That could be like the title of my future autobiography. <laughs> poop, poop explosions and butt baths. The kitten lady story. Um, people think that kittens are just all cuddly and cute. And I'm like, well, yeah, but you spend a lot of time doing butt baths and stuff too. All I want to say here is, if anybody tells you you can't bathe a kitten, 
that is just not true. Not only can you, but you you ought to in certain situations. Uh, you can see on the left here, this little poor little guy is like covered in diarrhea. And if I were to let that just cake on there, that can result in scalding discomfort, like infection. Um, and it just sends them this message that like they're not being cared for, right? Because their mom would keep them clean. So it breaks my heart that, um, anybody thinks you can't clean a baby you totally can the risks are of course making them um if they're wet and they stay wet for too long um they can get cold these kittens need to need a lot of help with temperature regulation um so what do you do you under one minute guys like really 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 short you know warm water comfortable on your skin water and you just wash the part that is dirty. You know, it's not like you have to bathe the whole kitten head to toe. Um, you can just bathe their booty and then wrap them up in a little towel and then put them on a heat source, you know, put them back on their heat pad, but back comb them so that their fur aerates, it gets, it gets um, dry faster. You know, never take a kitten and like soak them in water and then just put them in a playpen, um, they can definitely get very, very cold like that. Um, but please wash your kittens butts if they're dirty, you know, at least baby wipes. Um, and then in terms of products, um, some people use like an unscented dish soap. I like using unscented baby shampoo, um, something fragrance free. All right, this is gonna be super fast. Sibling suckling. Kittens together can suckle on each other and they can end up with a lot of problems from that. Um, usually they're attacking the genitals or, you know, when they're, when they're suckling on the genitals, it can stimulate the other animal to poop. Um, so they can actually hurt, they can really cause a lot of injury to their sibling, but also um, it's not good to have someone pooping on your head. Uh, as you can see here, um, and that can result in a whole lot of different problems. So um, if you have kittens who are suckling on each other, please take it really seriously, separate them. Don't try a bunch of weird costumes on their heads and stuff to make it stop. Just keep them separated, um, at least for a period of time until they're able to manage that behavior. A um, lot of, lot of um, issues can arise from that. I just wanted to put this picture in here because it's hilarious. I don't even really know why I put this in here. I just, while I was looking through my photos, I was like, this is the funniest poop photo in my entire phone. So this is my, <laughs> this is my, my poor partner uh, sleeping the morning away, blissfully unaware that <laughs> a kitten has pooped and peed on him. <laughs> I love it. I just had to put this in here, but I guess the lesson in this photo, I really just wanted to include this photo, <laughs> but um, inappropriate pooping, like why is a kitten pooping on the bed? <laughs> uh, a kitten's pooping on the bed because they shouldn't have access to the bed at this age, basically. Um, when kittens are learning to go to the bathroom on their own, you should keep their world a little bit small because if you make their world too big, they think all sorts of things are appropriate places to go to the bathroom. Like a blanket seems like a perfectly fine place to go to the bathroom because it has some give to it and they can cover it, right? They can cover it just enough that Andrew doesn't realize that they've gone to the bathroom on him. Um, at least it's a good looking poop, right? Yeah. Um, this is just a funny photo. Sorry, guys. Sorry, Andrew. Sorry, like Andrew. Andrew. I did ask him if I can share this and he laughed and said it was fine. So, you know. All right. This one is just also another funny thing that I put in here, poop lounging. Why do kittens lay in their poop? I don't know, they just do this. Um, keep their litter boxes clean, avoid uh, making other areas seem like litter boxes. Give them another super cozy place to hang out. If it seems like they're looking to hang out in a box, give them another box with a soft blanket in it so that they're not laying in their poop. We don't want kittens laying in their poop. Okay. We're almost to the end here, Rachel. I know you have a lot to say about No, my power, my power went back on, so I'm trying to join on my computer. Oh, you know what? We're so close to the end. Um, okay. That's fine. But it, what, it's up to you, whichever one you want to do. Um, do I share this story, or do we just talk about zoonotic disease? No, you share the story. Okay. This is um, the only non-kitten photo in this, in this whole thing. And the reason that I put this in here is because this was actually 
this is a long time ago. It's probably, mm, this is probably 13 years ago. It's a long time ago. Um, and I got worms from a raccoon. There I said it. I have never talked about that on the internet, but I did. I got worms from a raccoon. Um, and this is the raccoon who gave them to me. I was volunteering with wildlife um, in Costa Rica. And um, I don't know how this happened other than that there was not soap in the bathroom. Um, and there's no soap for me to wash my hands with. I did my best, but I was, you know, interacting with a raccoon. And then a couple days later, I ended up in the hospital. Um, and so uh, I can laugh about it now. It wasn't very funny at the time. Uh, I was really, really upset and was crying and it was just terrible um, to be in another country with worms in the hospital. Um, but it definitely taught me a lesson about <laughs> zoonotic parasites. Um, so Rachel, do you want to talk about zoonosis and why it is so serious and what it means? Sure. So zoo zoonosis or zoonotic disease is basically something that can pass from um, animals to people or potentially vice versa. Um, but in this case, we're referring to infections we can get from animals. And a lot of the parasites we've talked about are transmissible to us. Um, and if you're an adult with a good healthy immune system, hopefully you'll have no issue. Um, but that being said, children, the elderly, anybody who's immunosuppressed in any sort of way on medication, pregnant, um, you're definitely at risk. You should always be washing your hands before you eat and after handling poop. It doesn't mean that you won't get worms. Um, and if you do get them, you'll get to experience just how terrible the your kittens probably feel um, with them. The other important thing is that we know from studies that animals can live with a certain degree of a parasite burden. A lot of wild animals have parasites um, and they live just fine lives and have normal poop and do okay. Now, the, the important part about having um, testing, you know, testing animals for parasites and treating them is that when we start introducing these animals into our homes and into our community, um, our job is public health. And that's a very important job of a veterinarian is to prevent the people from getting sick. And if people are getting sick, to report it. Um, so foodborne illnesses, animals can be carriers of, especially if you're feeding raw diet, they're now carriers of salmonella and campylobacter, um, which can pass to humans and, and make them very sick. And those are reportable for humans and, and can end in, in very bad hospitalization. So um, treating parasites and treating diarrhea um, can be, um, can be really important, really even just from a, a public health perspective and protecting our families. Mm -hmm. um, so I know a lot of people are like, Ugh, parasites, you know, they can be fine with parasites. That's not the point of it. The point is that um, we're not. And it's really important as our job, you know, as community members is to protect our community. Mm -hmm. So that's important. Yeah, thank you for that. And um, I have to say, this year, last year, hopefully we all learned a lot about the importance of hand washing, but just wash your hands, you know, wash your hands with warm water and soap, wear gloves if you're interacting with um, a sick animal, you know, common sense stuff. Yeah. Transmission between animals is also um, very possible, especially between, you know, cats and kittens. Um, so I just wanted to share this photo of uh, Rune licking Ferguson's butt to say like be careful with your animals in your home right like if you bring home a new foster kitten fresh off the street that's probably not the right time to be letting your cats lick all over them right yeah um, and uh, the thing that kills me is I hear a lot of people like I, I get a lot of people at the clinic who come in and they're foster parents and their own pet's aren't up to date on vaccines. They have not been to a vet and had a fecal test in the last year. I recommend six month testing, especially if you're, if you're a foster parent specifically, um, you know, protecting your animals is really important. And, and that being said, we take the risks with the rewards, right? And so sometimes I have a really 
sick, sad kitten, and it has something, it has parasites, let's say, and it's not going to kill my adult cat, and, and my adult cat is going to provide a lot of comfort and support for that baby, then I will take the risk. But I'm also making sure that if, that I'm, I'm getting my cat tested for parasites, I'm treating her if she shows any signs of illness, and that she's up to date on all her um, things that I can, I can keep her up to date on so that I'm giving her the most protection. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. So just be really careful. And this is again, the reason why we do not ever take a bunch of random groups of kittens and shove them all together. Right. Because after this whole talk, hopefully you've seen how many things can be going wrong. And it's sort of like, a a lottery. What does each kitten have? What is each one going to be carrying with them? The more you combine litters together, the more you're increasing the risk that there's um, transmission. So um, we do a two week quarantine for all of our kittens. And that's not just like two weeks and then you're together. That's two weeks and you were healthy during that time um, or two weeks and you were treated during that time and time has passed sufficient that we feel like it's, it's safe to introduce you to someone else. There's still, always, there's still always risk, um, but I uh, highly recommend doing a quarantine period. You know, this that's Ruthie on the left, that's Mr. Peep on the right. They are best friends and got adopted together, but first they were separated from each other for a period of, of two weeks. Um, so quarantining, sanitizing, making sure you have all of that, um, all of that protocol in place is really important. So when we care about kitten poop, it keeps our kittens healthy. Here's uh, Mr. Peep and Ruthie uh, enjoying their, their meeting and getting to be best friends. And, uh, you know, certainly giving them that, that period of time um, gave them the ability to, uh, you know, be together in a way that was healthy for them. So that is everything we have. We did it. And we're only two hours and 42 minutes into our talk. So thank you everyone for caring enough to stay this whole time. These are the places you can find us, um, websites, social media, um, our nonprofit is Orphan Kitten Club. You can find um, at our website, orphankittenclub.org. You can find a lot more um, instructional videos um, on my YouTube, youtube.com slash kitten lady. And then if you are in the uh, greater Los Angeles area, um, Rachel's clinic is absolutely amazing. It is an urgent care clinic. So please don't go there for uh, try to make like a standard vaccine appointment or something with her, but great um, urgent care practice. Anything you want to share about that? Uh, nope. But if you do need, if you do need help, let us know. And, um, all the vets that work there are trained in kittens. Yeah. It's truly, it's truly like the best, best place. You do such a good job. So, um, I'm going to stop screen sharing and then I'm going to look at some questions, but I know we just have talked for so long here. So, uh, you tell me how long you have, Rachel. Do you want to just go until one? Uh, maybe one, one fifteen. I want people to have an, a chance to get some answers. If they start repeating, then we can sort of. Okay. So, um, do you, are you able to see the Q and A, or do you want me to pick some up? So I'm going to leave for one second and join on my computer so I can see the Q and A at the same time. Sure. Yeah. Go for it. Um, and I am going to go ahead and uh, scroll through some of these. Again, if anybody joined late, um, some of your questions might have been already answered in the beginning portion. Um, so anything that's already been answered, we're going to not be answering here, but might be answered um, if you go back and watch the recording. Um, and I'm going to try to avoid any questions that are so specific that it might not apply to every single person um or might not might not be widely applicable do you are you able to see the q a yeah i am just opening uh so mine just my q a is is actually blank i think because i just joined okay i will i will put some on the screen um okay let's see <laughs> here's one are you able to see it 
Oh, let's see. Um, sometimes we get babies with mamas since mamas take care of it. How do we know when baby's having a problem? Um, basically, if your baby is acting like it's sick. So, you know, if it's away from mom, if it doesn't seem to be nursing, you can, even if you get babies with moms, unless mom is fully feral, I do recommend weighing your babies once a day, um, because then you can know that they're gaining weight. And if they're not gaining weight, then that's a suggestion that, you know, potentially there's a problem. Or if you're seeing poop staining on the outside of baby more than once, like, you know, moms are going to clean them, but there will be poop explosions outside of that. Then that's, uh, that's when you know there's an issue. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, okay. Here's a question about fecal transplants. And they said um, they had a, a kitten with a fecal transplant that was very helpful. And what's your experience with that? I love fecal transplants. Um, uh, so fecal transplants, just for people who don't know, is taking uh, poop from a healthy cat who has healthy gut bacteria, who doesn't have any infectious communicable diseases, um, and actually either <laughs> doing an enema into a sick kitten or, um, feeding it to them. We won't talk about that. Um, but basically you're giving them the appropriate bacteria in their gut. Um, it's not a first line treatment, but it is something that I have used and I've used it for multiple species. I do love it. Um, you just really have to be cautious about where you're getting that poop from and how you're using it. Um, and there's great studies in people. Okay, so this is a really good question that I think a lot of people have a similar question to this, which is, about um, volunteering for a rescue that uh, does not do fecal testing and instead kind of like gives medication, different medications until something works. Are there long-term health effects on the kitten and would it be less expensive to do a fecal and treat exactly what's causing the issue rather than dispense loads of different medications? Yeah, so that's a really serious one and one that makes me quite angry. Um, and um, the first part of this is, is advocating. So you guys need to advocate for vet care. And I, I get it, it's hard, um, you know, but being that voice, and as we've seen, you know, with Hannah's followers, having a voice and seeing that there is a community out there and a need um, is a really, is, is good to know that there is a different way to do things and that medical care is important. So that's the first part, being your kitten's advocate and being a good advocate and finding other people who advocate similarly. Mm -hmm. um, secondly, um, there are grants. There are grant, like you can, you can apply for grants, including the Mighty Kitten Club grants that, um, you know, potentially will allocate you some funds for medical care, or you can fundraise and have a small fund that you have for when you do rescue kittens, if they do need medical care and, and this, you know, this um, rescue is not going to uh, reimburse you, that at least you have this cushion so that you can go see a vet, an appropriate vet that you've you vetted, um, and that will help you. Mm -hmm. Yes, there's definitely a, a lot of problems with giving medications. Part of that is um, for the kitten, you know, it can cause a lot of detrimental effects, but also, and also continued diarrhea, like we were saying, if you have coronavirus, continued diarrhea can actually lead more commonly lead to mutation of the virus into FIP. But also then when we are using medications inappropriately, we're getting resistance from bacteria, from parasites. So those medications won't actually may, might not actually be that effective later on. Mm -hmm. So, um, it's, to me, it, it's, it's a form of negligence and I, I, I don't like throwing that word around, but, um, it, I think just advocating and looking at different ways that, that this could be helped. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And I, I love what you said about advocating and, and, you know, not to be so disparaging of, of organizations that are, you know, I obviously understand there are cost considerations. There are, um, different levels of experience for people who are running organizations, but it is the responsibility of a 501c3 nonprofit or a municipal shelter 
Um, it's the responsibility of an organization whose mission is to care for animals to properly care for those animals. And part of that is fundraising to have a budget to provide appropriate medical care to them. Um, Rachel talked about how our nonprofit Orphan Kitten Club actually has a grant program. Um, it's called the Mighty Cat Program. You can learn about it at orphankittenclub.org slash mighty cat. Um, it is only open to our partner organizations at this time, but we have uh, over 50 partner organizations throughout the country right now, and that number is growing. Um, we hope that it can continue to grow with more support. So if you're watching this and you um, want to donate to, uh, to Orphan Kitten Club, um, that is really where um, so much of our funding goes is towards helping organizations. And, and Rachel and I are both on the team that, that awards those grants. And I would love, wouldn't you love to see a grant come in, like a grant proposal come in for just fecal testing? I like I would be like, fund yeah. it, fund it, fund it, fund it. Like, yes, I would love to see that because um, yeah, it is, it is. And I, I've been in your shoes. Like I've been a volunteer for organizations that say, oh, well, we'll just give them Albon. Um, and I'm like, well, can we test them? No, just give them Albon, you know? Um, so yeah, we want, we want more testing and it's, it's not, it doesn't have to be super cost prohibitive. No, and again, if you do have a big enough rescue organization, sign up with a lab, get yourself those discounts, use them. Same thing. There's also veterinary, um, purchasing companies that supply certain types of supplies. And a lot of those supplies come at a great discount to rescues, as long as a rescue is working with a vet. So you can get revolution really cheap. Um, as long as you're working with a vet and under the guidance of a vet, you can get those things at a discount um, from veterinary purchasing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. Um, somebody mentioned that they, some people would like us to answer questions anonymously. I guess it's putting names on the screen. Um, so I will just read the questions rather than pop them up there just in case okay. they don't want their name shown. Um, should all kittens in a litter be fecal tested or just one before treatment begins? I like to mix their poops. <laughs> I like to like take a little bit from this one and a little bit from this one. I like, so usually what I'll see is like, they'll go to the litter. If I'm stimulating them, I'll take a, a, a smattering of all of them. Or, um, you know, uh, if I'm, um, if, if they're going in a litter box, I'll take like a, a couple or like, more than one and I'll mix them together. So I'll, I'll often do it as a litter um, and treat them as a litter. Mm -hmm. Which is, if you really wanna get into it and we wanna talk about advocating for kittens, not ideal because you know kittens are individuals. Um, but if we're talking about rescue situations and trying to deal with financial constraints and also trying to do best by our kittens, then, um, that is one area that I think herd health is an appropriate thing. Testing, you know, combining fecals, um, because usually if one has it, they all have it. Um, not always, but um, Often. I think this is an appropriate way that you can do that testing. Mm -hmm. um, we had a couple people ask if their rescue that they foster through does not have or does not desire to have um, an IDEX account, um, can they make one personally? And the answer is no. Um, however, your, any veterinarian you go to can send out a fecal for you. So if you're an individual foster parent and the organization you're fostering through does not have an account, that's totally fine. You can go to any veterinarian and they can send it out for you. Yeah. Um, Someone, oh. sorry, go ahead. Oh, do, are you able to, you're able to see them, right? Yeah, they're, they're coming up now. Okay, yeah, you can fix them. Um, someone asked, is it okay to provide a variety of, of wet kitten foods, brands, flavors, textures? Um, it is, but I usually recommend sticking with one. Again, when you have the novelty, you're going to start having gastrointestinal issues. And same thing, like if you're, let's say you're feeding a brand that has different flavors, you don't want that. You really want to stick with one. I rec uh, you, and you want it to be a kitten food, a specific kitten food. If you're really having that much problem getting a kitten to eat, then I think there needs to be a greater look at why this kitten isn't wanting to eat solids. Are you weaning too early? Is there an underlying issue? Um, why does this kitten not want to eat? Mm -hmm. 
Somebody asked, um, is it worth it to preemptively treat for tapeworm in any kittens who have fleas? Um, my answer is not necessarily the rule, but my answer is I don't. Um, yeah. Will they probably develop tapeworms? Yes. Um, every kitten though that goes through adoption should be going to have its vet checkup, which includes a fecal for its back and it's at its vaccine appointment. And so they can potentially look at those then. The other thing too, is what we were talking about earlier is um, the tapeworm medication is not approved for kittens under a certain age or weight. And so it's really important that we're not just preemptively giving a medication that is not designed for kittens. Um, there are some things that we can preemptively treat for like roundworms that come from mom. And those are those I'll, I'll share those guidelines with you later, but, um, I don't really recommend preemptively throwing mm -hmm. medication at kittens. Mm -hmm. I'm seeing so many questions about IDEX accounts, which is great. I'm really happy a lot of people are interested in that um, and how you set it up. If you just go to, I think it's just IDEX.com, there will be instructions, but you you do need a veterinarian. Yeah, you need to be under the- To help you with that. So um, that is not for individuals watching this to be like, oh, let me go set up an account. Like if you if you run an organization, talk to your veterinarian about it. If you don't run an organization, but you, you volunteer for one, I would recommend talking to the person who does run the organization and letting them know that that's a resource that's available. And just knowing, just because you, you don't set up an IDEX account doesn't mean you can't submit fecals. Yeah. You know, and that's yeah. where fundraising is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is there any way to help save a kitten with sepsis? I've lost so many to this. Um, yeah. so yes, the answer is yes, it needs to be hospitalized, but looking towards the signs and I'm not going to go too much on this because this is a poop talk really, but looking at those signs, those preemptive things. So is the poop bad? Are they dehydrated? Are they gaining weight or not gaining weight? Um, are they not able to maintain their own temperature, even with heat support, looking at these clinical signs at any time you're starting to see this change, being on the lookout and getting to a vet faster before we actually get to sepsis is going to potentially save this kitten from sepsis. But unfortunately, once you get to the sepsis point, getting them back from the edge is very difficult. It's not impossible, mm -hmm. but it, it requires intensive care mm -hmm. at a hospital. Hospitalization. Mm -hmm. There's, there's several questions that are using a term that um, makes my eye twitch a little bit. And I wonder if you will feel the same, which is crash protocol. Um, does that, uh, why does that upset me? Because I know why it upsets me because um, there's not like one way to, like there's not one way to be dying and there's not one way to help someone who's dying. And the answer almost always is they need to go to a hospital. Um, yeah. If you have a kitten that is crashing, you need to go to a hospital. And I understand you may not be close to a hospital. I understand it may be the middle of the night. I understand, I understand that there are a lot of factors. The answer is that if you have a kitten that starts to crash, you, you either need to get to a hospital or you need to have some, some discussion with the rescue that you've been working with about what happens if you have a crashing kitten. Mm -hmm. um, but a crashing kitten is probably going to crash and pass away. And so the answer is, instead of trying to just warm it and force feed it sugar and get fluids into it, you're, you're basically just band-aiding a sepsis. And so- Prolonging suffering. Yeah. And um, so, so you need that it like, it's so hard for me to talk about without getting like a little bit like, no. Yeah. And it's don't hard. Get like there are that, and that's something that we, you know, Rachel and I look at a lot of protocol for different organizations because we're fortunate enough to get to see all of that through our partnerships. Um, and I do know that that is a thing within some organizations that there's like a protocol for like, if a kitten is crashing, do this. Um, that is not the way that we, work here. And now don't get me wrong, both of us, even as experienced people, still occasionally walk in on one of our kittens dying. Totally. Crashing. Absolutely. But the answer means that we need to get them veterinary care, whether that's humane euthanasia or whatnot, immediately. Mm -hmm. okay. 
And euthanasia is sometimes an appropriate option, especially like, I mean, I've had, and sometimes I'm on the other side of it. People will bring me animals and say like, what can you do for them? And I can look and say like, this is a, you know, so there have been times that I've said, I, this is a kitten that I, I would personally talk to a veterinarian about euthanasia for, because I do not think that they will come back from this and to sit there and continue trying to feed them sugar water is just prolonging suffering. So. And death is not, death is not a failure. Death is not a failure. Death is actually a nice, a nice tool that we have to use to, to end suffering. Mm -hmm. And it sucks that it feels like the end of a fight or a failure, but it is absolutely not. And we have to switch the way that we perceive death and humane euthanasia, even in a baby, um, in order for, to make sure that we're preventing suffering. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, let's move on from that. Uh, do you have any that you see that you would like to answer? I'm going to keep looking to, um, someone said whenever we rescue kittens from the street and, and start caring for them, they end up getting diarrhea, which is, I assume from the new food they're eating, they've never had before. We go through the deworming protocol, which doesn't seem to help. We also try Fortiflora. How can we avoid or fix the diarrhea? Uh, yeah. Um, so, um, I guess the question is, are you using the same food every time? Um, maybe there's a, a, a kitten food that's easier. I love Royal Caton, Canaan kitten food um, because it's highly digestible. And I find that I have the lowest instances of um, new food diarrhea with that food. Um, you know, the answer is, um, and I use Benabac probiotic. I don't, my personal experience is I haven't found Florida Fortiflora to be that effective. Now, one of the veterinarians I work with, um, who works at the Humane Society near me, loves the new Fortiflora and like swears by it. Um, but the answer is, if what you're doing isn't working, talking to your vet about a new protocol is important. And if that's still not happening, figuring out a way with your vet to stop diarrhea. Mm -hmm. uh, and I do want to mention too, there is prescript, there are prescription veterinary diets, which include a GI diet for kittens. There is one of those available as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we, we do sometimes reach for the GI kitten food that is from, you know, it's a prescription veterinary diet, um, in those extreme cases. Yeah. Um, um okay. okay. Do you have one? Someone said when kitten poop looks or looks like the same color, smells the same color as the canned food, is that malabsorption? No. Um, if it's, if you're having kittens who are having diarrhea, they're, they're not gaining weight, they're looking unthrifty, um, then that can be malabsorption. But a lot of times kitten food comes out smelling similar to what it goes in as. From okay, I have, a, I have a frequently asked question that I'm seeing. Pumpkin, question mark. Okay. <laughs> the answer is pumpkin is fiber, okay? Um, and so pump, so what this, the school of thought is, is that by adding bulk, by adding fiber to stool, you can allow these kittens to to stop diarrhea. The issue is what's the cause of the diarrhea? If it's just diarrhea that is being caused by, I don't know, random diarrhea, stress diarrhea, then sure, maybe a dose of pumpkin will help. But I hopefully if what you've taken away from this talk is that there are so many underlying causes of diarrhea. Um, and yes, adding fiber to the diet can help, um, but it's also very dehydrating. Fiber requires a lot of water. So you can cause constipation, you can cause dehydration. Um, you know, in a bind, sure, you can use a little canned pumpkin, but again, if, if it doesn't work within a matter of hours, move on, get yourself some veterinary care. Can I be honest with you? One of my most common social media comments that I delete are people recommending pumpkin to people who are asking questions about diet. I don't even keep pumpkin in my house. I don't even keep it in my clinic. Not, which is like you said, not to say that there's not some place potentially for that. I mean, I don't, it's not a thing that I do, but um, when somebody says my kitten has diarrhea, what should I do? And then all the comments underneath it say pumpkin, pumpkin, pumpkin. I'm like, 
that is just not the advice that you're, I don't want anybody to be receiving in any association with me. Um, you're, you're not, you're not dealing with the underlying cause of the diarrhea. You're not dealing with the cause of the diarrhea. And in most cases, you're not going to solve the diarrhea. Mm -hmm. um, okay. So um, I see a question that's a really interesting question, um, which is, I have a foster kitten with coccidia. Um, the vet says that it can live in the carpet for a year. So do I need to not foster for a year? And what I always say when people ask me about things like that is, do you think that hospitals and shelters close down for a year every time they see disease. Um, no, they do not, but they do practice proper sanitation Hi. practices. So yeah. first of all, we don't have carpets at yeah. the clinic, but yeah. secondly, so I don't know about coccidia living for a year, but I do know that Panluc virus can live for a year on soft surf uh, on environments, mm -hmm. um, and in soil for two years. Mm -hmm. Um, the thing is a not putting kittens on that surface, cleaning that surface appropriately so that hopefully we're not spreading mm -hmm. um, and practicing good, you know, practicing good protocols. So having a designated kitten area, I'm not going to turn around and show you my messy office, but in my office, I have a stand up crate system mm -hmm. and my kittens are quarantined in that area for the first while that I have them. And then they're allowed into a larger area, but um, I'm not letting them out in the rest of the house because the rest of the house is Rachel comes home from the bed and is yeah. dirty. And I still, don't get me wrong. I still practice. Like I mop the floors with a bleach solution and I do other things, but um, no, it doesn't mean that you can't foster for a year, but it does mean that you need to take some good cleaning precautions and, mm -hmm. and to act cautiously. Yeah, and I would act especially cautiously around carpet because anything that's porous that you can't um, put in a washing uh, machine. Um, yeah, I we don't like allow access to porous things that are not washable, i.e., my couch, our living room rugs, stuff like that, until kittens have been here for many weeks. Um, yeah. And after that, you know, yeah, you have some options, steam cleaners, um, you know, uh, disinfectants that are appropriate for what you're trying to kill. But I want to say, you know, like we use incubators here that are $1,500 incubators and people say, well, after you have a certain disease, pan Luke, you know, um, do you have to throw everything away? We do not throw away a $1,500 incubator when a pan Luke kitten is in it. We just take it apart. We sanitize everything multiple times, you know, down to the little fine grain of everything, but you you absolutely can. I mean, we've had pan Luke in our house this year. We've had Coxidi in our house this year. We sanitize, we move forward, the next ones come in and they're safe. You know, we just, you have to have strong protocol. And just remember things like your keys, your phone, your, you know, your those phones are nasty, y'all. Your phones are gross. Steering wheel of your car, things you're not really thinking about, those harbor, those harbor bacteria, viruses, parasites dirt. And so you just want to be sure that you're actually cleaning those things or not handling. Like I have a rule about how I handle my phones or also like, I don't play on my phones while I'm eating <laughs> mm -hmm. um, just mm -hmm. in case, you know, like for myself that I'm not ingesting particulates when I'm. Okay. Um, I have a question that I think is a great question for you. This is from a vet tech who works at an animal shelter and I'm going to abbreviate her question a little bit. Um, it's, She's hoping to get your opinion and recommendation about off-label treatment for medications that are not labeled for neonates. The vet staff team is under constant pressure to treat tiny babies, but so many DVMs are hesitant to go off-label. And of course, our resources are somewhat limited. So the guidelines according to the veteran, like the American Veterinary Medical Association are that if you are going to treat something, you're supposed to go on label first. So something that is prescribed for that use. Now, if you don't have something that's prescribed for that use and you can't access something prescribed for that use, as long as you discuss with your client or your whomever, the risks of potentially going off label, then you can go off label. Um, my answer is, 
if you're not going to treat or you can't treat, then euthanasia is the better option, you know? So, so if, if you can treat off label, then yeah, treat off label. Mm -hmm. As long as you are looking up your guidelines. So look up the guidelines in your country, um, because they, they are different based on the country. Um, and then going according to those guidelines. Mm -hmm. So if you can't, if you can't access on label drugs, um, but you can't access off label, um, and everybody is aware of the risks and they've been discussed and that kind of stuff and go off label. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, that's great. Thank you. Somebody asked, they said that their rescues protocol for constipation is to give Nutrical, and is that an appropriate, um, treatment for constipation. I'm not aware of that being a treatment for constipation. Nutrical is a calorie supplement. It doesn't treat constipation. I actually hate Nutrical. I hate Nutrical because everybody throws it at kittens and they're like, oh, this kitten is not maintaining its own blood sugar. Let's just force feed it Nutrical every time. And like, oh, you bought a new puppy and it's two pounds. Only feed it twice a day, but here, give it Nutrical. So I just, I hate Nutrical. I don't stock it. I don't have it. I just I'm like, go away. It's my neutral. Uh -huh. uh -huh. Okay, great, great tip. Okay, you said you want to go to 115. It's 111. Let's take one or two more questions. Do you see one that you'd like to answer? Uh, they're not really coming up on my thing, so. Oh, okay. Um, I see one that is actually a very common question. Um, our rescue vet is not extremely knowledgeable on neonatal kitten care, but is open to working with us. Have you used PENG on intake with neonatal kittens? And this is something that I know some rescues um, do or recommend giving PENG to every single kitten when they come in. What are your thoughts on that, Rachel? I, <laughs> I, <already noticed. laughs> um, I know rescues that use PENG, okay? Um, like shelters that use it and swear by it. What I will tell you is, you are practicing herd health. And like I said, in some instances that is okay, but like we've talked about inappropriate use of antibiotics, the harmful effects it can have on kittens. The fact is these are same antibiotics that you and I require if we get sick. And if, if there becomes an antibiotic resistance and we get sick and there's no antibiotics to treat us, we're, now I can't say the word, but so my answer is no, I don't. I don't advocate for just giving antibiotics to every kitten, an antibiotic injection to every kitten that just walks through the door. Mm -hmm. Does that mean that I don't give a lot of antibiotics to kittens? No, I do. Yeah. I don't use Penji, but um, I do give a lot of antibiotics to kittens that I think need it um, because there's an issue, but I never advocate for just throwing medication, specifically antibiotics at a kitten just as protocol. Uh, I think it's an inappropriate use of antibiotics. I think it's an inappropriate way to be treating animals and it sets them up for risks and your whole shelter system up for risks. So what happens when you get infections that actually need Penji? Mm -hmm. They're going to be resistant to it. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm very against it. But um, again, if you if you need to practice herd health, then that's a discussion that you have to have. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, well, um, this has been awesome. The last question is a technical question that we'll answer, which is, um, will registered attendees have access to this recorded Zoom talk? Yes, you will. Um, and uh, it may not come to you today. It may not come to you tomorrow. Um, it can take 48 hours, uh, but please be patient with Cat Camp because they are um, doing an incredible job and they're gonna get everything out to you as quickly as they can. Um, so on that note, I wanna again, thank Cat Camp for hosting this. I wanna apologize for going more than twice over the amount of time we were given. But what else do you expect from us when you ask us to talk about kitten poop? We got a lot to say. Um, so thank you again to Cat Camp and thank you again to Pet Ag for sponsoring. And thank you, Rachel, for being, you were such an awesome person for this. I mean, first of all, you're the person I send all my kitten poop photos to. True. And second of all, your power went out and you still like, <laughs> you powered through it without power. 
There you go. Modern technology. Dogs barking. So I'm sorry. Shoot, no, it's so cool. You did a great job. And um, and thank you to everybody who stuck around for the entire time. Thank you. Uh, I just am blown away that this volume of people are um, happy to spend their Saturday doing this with us. And uh, I'm really, really grateful to everybody involved. So thank you all so much. And we are going to sign off.